There will be no neighbors if there's a nuclear bomb. You voted to mobilize and send money to Ukrainian Nazis. You're a coward. You're a progressive socialist. Where are you against the war mobilization? He's telling the right truth. You have done nothing. Tulsi Gabbard has shown guts where you've shown cowardice. I believed in you, and you became the very thing you sought to fight against. That's what you've become. You are the establishment, and you are the reason why everybody will end up in a nuclear war unless you choose to stand up right now and denounce the Democratic Party. Will you do that? Yes or no? Okay, simple. Are you going to stop nuclear war? Yes or no? There is no line, because this is bullshit. None of this matters if we're all dead. None of it. You know that. Then let's take it up right now, because this is the only thing that matters. This is the only thing that matters right now. We could be in a nuclear war at any minute, and you continue to fund it. That's what's going on. Why not right now? You're the liar here. Nobody has held you accountable. That's what's happening. And it is time for you to stand up and realize that what you've been saying has been lies. Let your conscience come through for once. Bring back memories, man. Dude, it's like Mario Savio <laughs> and the uh, Berkeley free speech movement, uh, you know, calling for us to throw ourselves on the gears of the machine. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's old school. It's but Mario school. Savio style, bro. <laughs> I mean, wow. Wow. Is that entertaining or what? Yeah, definitely is. Definitely is. And I mean, I hope, he, I hope he's going to run for her seat. I mean, that would be uh, really fascinating to take her seat away through that uh, uh, situation. Well, and keep in mind, you you know how she got her seat, right? She ran a racist campaign against an older white uh, incumbent. Right. Who was so secure in the seat. Mm -hmm. and, and, I mean, he didn't even bother having to show up. Right. As Nancy Pelosi said, you know, whoever the Democrat is could run against a glass of water in that location. So of course right. it's just sitting there. And then all of a sudden you got swiped from the side, which makes you wonder why is it that suddenly some weird candidate candidate comes in from the side mm. and just steals a power position because mm -hmm. he was pretty high up in like the committees and things like that. In right, Congress. right. Right. Hmm. By the way, that's think... Jose Vega from the Bronx, by the way, people, uh, one of the top natives of the Bronx, <laughs> who's going to be on a little while later on in the show. Um, that's, yep. as, just to give a shout out to Vega, who will be on here to explain it himself. Oh, yeah. We wanted to give a little taste early, and then we've got a, another video to bring him in when uh, he comes up. He'll, he'll be here yeah, around 6 o'clock Eastern. This is part of our continuing um, attempt to bridge the uh, populist right, the populist left, um, mm -hmm. and talk to the other side and squeeze the middle, who are the neocons and the warmongers out of their uh, basements. Um, so maybe this will be effective. I am just trying new things and new ideas with Eric. Yeah, I think it's a, a definitely a good idea. And, and by the way, it, thank you know I'm glad that people on the left are willing to come on. It it's like they have to go really far left, really far right for them to talk. Anybody in the middle, anybody corporate. It's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, hello, hello. hello. Mom's anybody the word. there? Well, we were on with uh, Rich Barris and his wife this morning talking about some of this on the People's Pundit, Eric and I, which I'd recommend. Yeah, it was fun. It's always fun have uh, being on with them. Uh, Rich will probably be coming back here any week now. Who knows? He, he's kind of been cycled in as a regular, like um, like the occasional Barnes and Viva and whatnot. That would be nice. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> that would well, be nice. Well, well, well we, we, we discussed. Next week. Yeah, we're going to see the, well, Eric and I going to Florida uh, to meet up with Viva in some um, trio of glory. I don't know what's going to happen down there. We're going to try to do some live shows out of Florida with or without Viva. 
maybe both. Um, Should we be worried though? Because he was saying, "How do you feel about boats in the ocean?" No, he's asking me to uh, us to go <laughs> shark fishing. I, I said, "You know, Viva yeah, but shark. are we the bait?" No, I know. I mean, the shark will. I don't have the strength <laughs> to pull a freaking shark out of the ocean. What is, what is he kidding me with that? In a little boat, in a in a in a rowboat, we're gonna go shark fishing. What the hell is he talking about? I, I don't know, but I'm just going. Um, I'm a big person. I don't want to be chum here. No, I, <laughs> I I want him, and we discussed this, which he's agreed to do, and and is to bring him, and obviously you and his son to a Marlins game. And so I can explain baseball to the new American who has just arrived. His son is craving also to learn about baseball. And I promised I would take him to see the Marlins uh, over the weekend. So hopefully we could do that. That's an American type thing. I don't know about shark fishing, but uh, going to a baseball game, I think <laughs> might be a little bit more pleasant. We can have a similar discussion in a baseball park than we could on a boat where we're being munched by sharks. Um, of course, the great line by Richard Dreyfuss in Jaws, uh, the Peter Benchley novel turned into the Steven Spielberg film, uh, is um, to, to, to Roy Scheider, a guy I met many years later, great guy. Mm. The actor Roy Scheider plays the sheriff of, uh, of Amity Beach, whatever the hell that was. But he says to Roy Scheider, we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> when he sees the uh, the Jaws uh, shark. That's where it, that came from. Yeah, we're going to need a bigger boat. That's what oh, Richard no, no, Dreyfuss is. Okay, it's, it's going to be terrible because I forgot about the initial reference. Mm -hmm. But in Taco, Taco Bell had a series of commercials with a chihuahua mm -hmm. in the uh, late 90s. And they were tied in with the Godzilla movie, or at least one of them. And it showed the little uh, chihuahua with a box with a stick under it, you know, like a trap, you know, with a, the pull cord. And then Godzilla in the background goes, I think I'll need a bigger box. Oh, that's probably where it came from, yeah. I, I'm sure it is. I just didn't realize the original source of that. R yeah, Richard Dreyfuss, uh, who will later play Dr. Evil, Dick Cheney, in the movie W by Oliver Stone. Um, well, what about your story with Richard Dreyfus? Uh, with oh, the that's right. We cover that. We cover that. Where shop, he went right? running. Yeah, the custom shop episode. If anybody wants to see my my two encounters with Richard Dreyfus, one is where I asked him to play Jonas Salk in my movie that turned out to be an episode of Salk versus Saban on America's Untold Stories, the 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 historical feud. But he was supposed to play uh, Jonas Salk in um uh, in the movie version of what i was trying to get made he insisted that sulk was too much of a hero he couldn't play him he had to play albert saban who was more nefarious and then later proving his point played dick cheney in the oliver stone movie w um uh, which i thought was also interesting so it was foreshadowing of him wanting to play evil characters which is a good good call um, right now apparently this show from the other day has gone viral eric the one on dick carlson I mean, yes. what is what is going on over there with that show? And it finally got monetized. Oh, thankfully. thank the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior. I, I I always love it, you know, when when I sit there and go, oh, look, the show's doing well. And uh, it'd be nice if uh, we got some ad dollars for it. Thank you very much. Um, but anyway, the, the situation with Dick Carlson, the one I wanted to recommend was the the Lady and the Dale, which I told Rich Barris about this morning uh, on HBO, the four-part um miniseries or any uh, whatever you want to call it docuseries uh it goes off the rails kind of woke in episode four but the first three are really good and four is w definitely watchable so i recommend that for the weekend the lady and the dale uh, d-a-l-e which is the name of the car uh the three-wheeled yellow car that we showed in the photos last week uh, on Tuesday. and my middle name by the way as everyone knows and of, of course. course don't forget dale evans from uh roy rogers fame the, no, it's uh, a very popular name. Right. The, <laughs> the, anyway, so I recommend that. And again, the Phil Spector thing, which is on Showtime, uh, I think it's called Spector, a four-part series on the murder of Lana Clarkson and Phil Spector's career. That's an interesting dude. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no. It's a long history because not only does he create the girl groups, you know, and this and the wall of sound and, you know, that whole uh, uh, situation in terms of rock in the in the late 50s, early 60s. He then goes into a period of decline because of the Beatles uh, and the rise of regular rock and roll, 
that he's got nothing to do with. He ends up in a fight with the Ramones. He produces mm. their album. That comes out fairly successfully, but the Ramones hate his guts. There's gunplay involved. And then later comes full circle and produces Imagine with John Lennon, the album. I mean, just mm. absolutely, you know, a, a double fantasy al uh, uh, album and, and um, comes full circle and becomes best friends with John Lennon. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, the I mean artistic man. artistically uh, comes full circle. Uh, obviously, he goes off the rails uh, later on at the House of Blues, which will be covered in that uh, 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 miniseries. Yeah, and if I recall, he was pretty off the rails all around, like just a little nutty, a little bit. Right. Nutty. Well, that goes yeah goes all the way back. I mean, um, there's a piece of footage in there where he's on Merv Griffin. Uh, that's really crazy where he, Eartha Kid is a guest and Merv Griffin brings him on and he is out there. And in that episode, he is really off his meds. And I think it was a, med, I think it was more of a med problem than anything else. I think he was bipolar and um, had some real mental issues. <laughs> Helton, right? <laughs> good point. Yeah. You might be in trouble, buddy. It's the third time you see me today. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. He's following Hunley. Uh, apparently, when they I, say they're following Hunley, they're really following Hunley. I know. I, I guess the notifications actually work for him. <laughs> Everybody else. Yeah, it's funny because they keep talking about notifications, and I'm going like, I don't have any notifications, but I know this. The show's on only twice a week, and I show up. I mean, how it's not, you know, I, I know the Tonight Show's on at 11:30. I don't get a notification from NBC. That being said, it's apparently not on any longer because of the writer strike. Yes, that's going to be quite interesting. What was it? What, we he barely touched on that. Somebody mentioned it, but it's a good question. What if somebody starts using chat GPT and says, write a monologue in the voice of blah, 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 and spit it out? Well, I don't think that's going to happen because there's signatories to the guild, but movie producers or independent movie producers are definitely going to do it to get around it and can make will make up fictitious names or themselves as the writer. I don't think there's any way they're going to be stopped doing that. In the TV world, that's really where the Writers Guild dominates in terms of muscle because the individual networks and the shows are signatory. So uh, in other words, um, let's say it's it's Stephen Colbert. Stephen Colbert is con the host are considered management just for the people at home. So they can't really write their own monologues because they're in the management side of the creative spectrum. The writers themselves are on strike. Some of them, I think one of the networks, um, either Kimmel or the other guy is paying their salaries so far. The other two networks are not paying their salaries. So uh, we'll see how long this lasts. But the, the, the TV writers are really beholden to these, uh, the situations over streaming rights, just so you know. So the streaming rights um, are important because it was left off the last writer's strike negotiation. And it was never dealt with in the 10 years since then. Now the problem becomes these people have commercials on the Tonight Show, let's say, Eric, right? Mm -hmm. There's commercials. They're, those commercials are not going to continue to generate revenue for the network because the network is running reruns. Capiche? Yeah. Okay. So that revenue stream for the networks is going to dry up rather quickly. There is another group that does streaming that couldn't care less, and that's Netflix and the people like them because they don't have commercials. They mm -hmm. can last forever during the strike. They have product that's evergreen. The people who are the most vulnerable, who may immediately buckle and want to sign and end the strike, are the studio, the, the networks related to the studios and television. The film uh, studios can last longer because they have stuff in the hopper. It's the live television that takes the biggest hit uh, in terms of the strike. And it, but, but what I'm saying is the industry is so divided physically uh, among the streamers that it's maybe a long time for this thing to be settled because there's different streamers. It's all about, it's all about residuals of streamers is what I'm saying. That makes sense. And question on that. Um, I, I, I am technically on strike, by the way. So oh, okay. I, I just, I just well, don't shit, put Why idea. are you here? No. Well, I'm on strike. I'm not writing or pitching. You can't even pitch anything to a producer, by the way. You can't even pitch anything. That's against the rules. 
Um, okay. Uh, no, I, I've always heard that in comparison that movies are a director's medium and television is a writer's medium and the That's showrunners true. are writers and, and it's a, a completely different paradigm. So the writer strikes a pretty big deal there. Right. I'm not talking about about sitcoms, though. I was talking about uh, the late night comedy shows. Uh, but oh, no, in, I get that. Right. 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 I, okay. I, I, it's I a different structure awesome. among yeah. sitcoms and, and the showrunners are writers. Yes. They're not management, although some of them are management. They depends. I, I think some of them are management. So uh, we'll see how that plays out. I'm not sure about every single one of them. But, yeah, showrunners can be management and they can be writers. OK. And um, somebody said. T. Logan, I don't see your super chat. I apologize, but I, I generally will read it at some point if I see it, but I don't see one. So. Logan, come on, bro. Let's get it together. Start. To, you know what it was? The fake out super chat. It was the old phony super chat. All right. No, but but getting back to the writer strike, I mean, it's such a pleasure not to have Stephen Colbert and and Kimmel spouting their propaganda every night. That's not only not funny but completely disingenuous and written from like almost the Soviet uh, uh, Politburo <laughs> in terms of comedy. You know, it's hard, like you said, it's in the earlier show with Rich, it's hard to be political and, and create art at the same time, because it, as you mentioned, Spike Lee, it gets in the way of the flow of the art. You know, Spike Lee has famously shot himself in the foot repeatedly now, like the second half of his career, because he'll literally stop a movie on a dime and put in whoop, 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 political message, political message. And you're like, you might as well go get popcorn at that point, you know, because it's that abrupt in terms of his lack of subtlety in his political message. Others are uh, better or worse than Spike in terms of that. And let me put it this way. You know, when you get back to the Hollywood 10 uh, in the 1950s, when they were jailed, uh, f basically for contempt of Congress, I think was really what they were, what they were charged with not answering the questions. Uh, the reality of it was that these screenwriters, these screenwriters in Hollywood were getting script notes from the actual Kremlin. Let me, let me repeat that so you understand it, because it's, it's something that, uh, is an untold American historical fact. They were getting notes from, uh, Soviet spies who were in Hollywood, who got notes on their screenplays from the Kremlin to their Soviet operative, to the actual uh, writers. Mm -hmm. if that, and, and that's what they were afraid of and at the um, Un-American Activities Committee hearings. And that was a fact. And that's why those writers were blacklisted. Because A, they wouldn't reveal their affiliation, they wouldn't name names, but in reality, the real crimes that they committed was taking script notes from the Soviets right out of the Kremlin. Which is a pretty big crime. Uh, they, were all, they were altering major Hollywood films to fit subtly, very subtly, fit the narrative that the Kremlin wanted. Think about that, folks. This was in 1952, 1953, that era of Hollywood filmmaking. Um, so think about that. But of course, we have revisionist history, and they were just persecuted people who were completely innocent. Mark, didn't didn't you see the coverage? I, I weren't you paying attention? I've seen some movies that HBO has made about it, but um, uh, yeah, no, I mean the truth is the truth. I mean you can't really deviate from the truth, and that is the particular truth in that matter that they were taking notes from the Soviet Union for their screenplays, as as odd as that sounds, but uh, historically documented. That actually makes me think of something else. Like um, CNN did their series as like 60s, 70s, 80s, and they're always coming out with these look backs at different decades. Mm -hmm. And if you watch like the CNN 60s and 70s, it's like uh, everyone who was young was a hippie mm -hmm. and a troublemaker, flamethrower, whatever. And it's like, but if you really look at it, the vast, vast, vast majority of the country were pretty much short hair squares. Mm -hmm. And I find it kind of interesting that they're they're representing this at a history like this is what culture looked like. I'm like, well, no, maybe in uh, you know a few zip codes, mm -hmm. but, it, but mean, overall, it did not look like that. They, that's a little misrepresentational. Yeah, take a look at the films of uh, well, what's his name from Breaking Bad? Uh, uh, Ryan, what's Cranston? 
Brian Bra- Cranston. Brian Cranston plays Dalton Trumbo in one of the HBO films. It's so disingenuous you want to throw up. I mean, this guy was an avowed communist, and he was one of the screenwriters I'm discussing. Another one was uh, Edward Dimitrik, uh, Lester Cole, Ring Lardner Jr. These are uh, four of the Hollywood Ten. And uh, they were taking script notes from Hollywood and putting in subtle uh, communist messages in their scripts. So um, there's a reason that they were persecuted, as they say. Crazy. And let me see for chats. We've got um, Thomas Whitten as a new member. So thank you very much. Oh, I want to give a shout out to Ziggy because this is one of the glasses. Hold it up to the camera so we can. Don't leave me alone, Hunley. I'm trying to drink out of things. <laughs> it says you can't take it with you on the glass. You can't take it with you? No, you can't, can't make, make this stuff up. You can't take it with you. I was thinking of a Hollywood film that was rewritten by communists. Uh, you can't make this stuff up is one of them. Another one is um, uh, AUS, who said America's Untold Stories. And then another one is Team Oswald. So thank you, um, Ziggy, for sending me a set of four of these lovely stemless wine glasses. And they look especially good with a dark liquid because it contrasts nicely, kind of like our logo with a black background. Extra ice for Ziggy. <laughs> Hold on. Eric's got his thermos sound he's going to give me right now. Oh, oh I, I have this off, but here, I can, oh, okay. I, I can put it on and, and, and take it up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're driving me crazy. Whoa, no, bro, bro, come on. Lighten up on the sound effects. All right. Um, let me see. Uh, TB, there. What was Kerry Thornley role in the JFK conspiracy? I think he's a deep state operative uh, trying to befriend and divert um, a Garrison, befriending, uh, supposedly befriending Oswald, but really diverting Garrison off the trail. There were a number of these guys at the time in New Orleans. Hmm, okay, and I agree with um, Blitzen. That glass has a beautiful ice <laughs> clinking noise. I know it's like really the right balance. It resonates perfectly. If I was making a film, I would foley this for drinking, you know, in a bar because they have to do sound effects. I would do this. How's it going, Bob? You want another drink? <laughs> well, you were just talking about that recently, right? About um, foley and you had to work around like all the collector cars, and there was a couple of stories. Yeah, you had about there, that. there's a yeah. I was just pointing this out because it's it's just a a, a bugaboo, a peccadillo about Hollywood uh, show cars. When they close the door on them, the insides are all stripped out of those cars. So there's always a tinny sound. It could be, it could look like a brand new Mercedes, but the clinking tinny sound of the car door, uh, they, for some reason, they don't foley that because they'd have to use a real car with a real model of a heavy duty car with a, and go out and do it, which they could. But most of the time, they just ignore that sound of the tin door of a car, show car closing and it sounds like a car that's made out of tin it's just a, a funny thing that i enjoy about foleying uh some some of the foley look there's foley artists just so people know foley is a post-production thing that gives you sound effects of, of foot uh, hitting pavement or uh, could be anything any any sound effect that you're seeing on screen uh amplified um Sometimes it'll be done uh, even with films. Uh, let me put it this way. It'll be done with home movies that have no sound. They'll add sound effects to home movies or war films, uh, more traditionally silent war films. They'll foley over and add sound effects of guns just to give people a typical one. You'll see, uh, let's say, the Vietnam War in color may not have sound. So they'll add sound. They'll foley onto that sound. But usually in post-production on a film, They'll add like uh, sound effects of feet walking on wood uh, or whatever it is. And a director will want to or or want to amplify or deamplify the amount of that sound effect, depending on the mood that he wants to create. So it's a very subtle thing. And Foley artists are indeed artists uh, who come up with insane devices to create sound effects in post-production to mimic, enhance or de-enhance, if that's a word, uh, the sound that they want to um have heard by the audience of things that are happening on screen. And one of them is, to me, is the odd sound of a tin show car with the door slamming and not having the resonance of a heavy duty car. But it's such a subtle thing that nobody would pick up on it except a psycho like myself. Well, it is funny though, because don't they do it? Like, for example, if you have a scene in a restaurant, right? When they're filming, it is absolutely quiet on the set. Don't make any damn noise and Mm -hmm. everything sounds perfectly. Then when you watch a movie, 
you've got all this background clinking and whatever. Yeah, that's all put in and post. And that's yeah. why I'm making the sound of the ice because this is what a Foley guy would do because, you know, he needs to add, like, the guy's hand shaking with the ice. That's what the director wants for some effect. That may not be at all heard in a boom mic situation with four guys sitting around a table having a dinner uh, in a movie. So that's all done in post-production. And Patrick Washburn's asking where the term came from. Isn't that a guy's name? It was a guy's name, yeah. It was one of the original guys who, who invented it. The Foley box um, is like a box with sand and gravel, and there's a box for different types of foot walking that you might have. And that's called a Foley box. And I don't know the full history of Foley, but yeah, it was a guy who was a sound effects dude uh, who specialized in Foley sound effects or sound effects in post named after himself. There were more subtle sound effects. Now you've, t you've told another story, which I just think is hilarious about, um, all the classic car people who were on set. Oh yeah. Cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really funny. The classic show car people are constantly polishing their cars. They worship these cars and rightfully so they're their bread and butter. Uh, and when they bring a car to a movie set, in between shots, they'll be polishing it and shining it up. And when you look at a movie, in some films, the cars, all of them on the street, are super shiny. So a real good director will have like a second AD or a PA go over and dull them to the complete disgust of the car show car owner who, who was obsessed with the car shining and looking great. But in reality, if you think about any film, any time period, not all the cars are washed and shiny on a particular block. And it stands out like a sore thumb to me when you see a period piece with a bunch of cars in a movie where every single one of them is shiny like they just came out of the factory. Whether it's 1949, 1939 or 1959, there are cars on the street that have not only are not of that year, but are have different levels of shine or dust or dirt. So it's a constant battle in real films with real directors who are concerned about that to not let every single um, car look like it just came out of a factory or even if it wasn't that year's car to look so shined and simonized and waxed as to distract from the scene itself. Uh, so it's really on the director to pull that off. I kind of wonder if that might be a legitimate use for CGI because like, you know, obviously with the guns and things like that, it's very difficult to emulate a real gunfire, but a stationary parked car to me, that's something that could be theoretically painted in after the fact. Oh yeah. I mean, but keep in mind all every CGI thing you do takes away from your budget of CGI, something else or post-production, mm -hmm. something else. So you could do whatever you want. You know, but at some point you got to say, I have to make a choice here monetarily. Am I going to, you know, turn down the color and dust up these uh, cars on the street in this scene? Or am I going to use the money for something else like Foley or whatever? So, yeah, in theory, you're right. You could. All right. And um, I, I did this for Helena, who wanted me to do some flashing, like um, pushing the subscribe button or the, or the sub roll of the locals. So we have a scrolling on the locals. Thank you very much, Helena. She's better than I am at advertising her stuff. Well, it looks like the subscriptions are really starting to take off due to the, um, the innocuous sound of that bell that continues to wait, wait, what the hell was that? That was the bell. I think that's when you hear the bell, it means you must subscribe with the red sign that, oh, there it is. There it is. Remember to subscribe. Thank you, Eric. I but, mean, you did, right, but make sure you, to, are you writing down scratching so it stays an odd number? Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm up to one bell. <laughs> I'm going to, one bell so far. So let's, uh, if you know what? The next time I'll do it, Miles I'll, do, I'll it. ring it twice. So we'll be up to three. And that way, you know. My, Miles is having a different reaction saying our <laughs> oh yeah he does yeah miles is like that miles yeah he's he's, get, he's getting the pavlov pavlovian uh reaction to the bell mm -hmm. well there's been all different choices as to what's in my thermos it, last week it was gin and tonic uh one person said it was gin, another person said it was vodka oh by the way we're now starting a new boycott there's a woman a trans woman named queen who fought with the Texas state legislature, legislature two weeks ago, uh, making a scene there trying to interrupt a uh, actual legislative process in Texas, the state house or the, the legislature. 
because uh, they were passing legislation or voting on legislation about transgender and children's rights. So she decided to disrupt that uh, legitimate uh, legislative process. So she's been rewarded now with a contract as the spokesperson for Shmirnoff Vodka, which I suggest that everyone either pour down the drain or at least boycott from here on out like we did with uh, Bud Light to boycott and break the back of Smirnoff Vodka as an economic force in the liquor industry. Uh, so this just broke uh, moments before the show about them hiring the new Dylan Mulvaney, despite the massive losses. These are social credit score driven political uh, uh, operations from BlackRock to enhance the credit scores of corporations who are being shaken down in an Al Capone style social credit score way um, to literally at times tank their own business to get a higher social credit score. Uh, which is what Bud did, and Bud took it on the chin financially, and Smirnoff will go down the same way. And they're willing to do it. They're willing to do it. They Budweiser knew they were going to take an economic bloodbath. They did it anyway. They destroyed their own uh, corporation. And the Marxists would like that to happen. Lovely. Well, our guest is here. Oh, uh, great. I, I'm going to go in, roll in with his latest presentation. We opened <laughs> with a with a spit with AOC. This one, I definitely want everybody to see because, well, he's treating reporters kind of the way they should. Okay, be. just to set it up. I mean, this is a Columbia School of Journalism, I think at Columbia University, but Jose will explain it more in detail. And I think there's a pantheon there of top level uh, mainstream newspaper editors. I think Dean Baguette might be up there. Um, and then the Washington Post editor and then two other people I'm not familiar with. But Jose will explain it after uh, Eric runs the video. Cool. Oh, is this the lecture hall with Seymour Hirsch? I, I just, I'm looking for the one with Seymour Hirsch because it's a policy and press hall event. So shouldn't we be talking about the Nord Stream since that's the biggest story of the century? And you guys, you know, I'm sorry. I mean, you have the executive editor of the New York Times there who came out with a phony story to try and block Seymour Hirsch. It just it's just kind of funny how that happened. You know, I mean, did you even acknowledge Seymour Hirsch? All of you are executive editors of papers that broke Pentagon, Me Lai, Watergate. Is this the same papers or not? I mean, is there anything you've gotten right? in the last 20 years, or am I mistaken about that? I mean, it's just kind of funny because Iraq, wrong. Syria, wrong. Russiagate, really wrong, okay? <laughs> and the list goes on and on. So the last thing you could do to try and actually fix your reputation is acknowledge that through leaks, we had to find out that Zelensky was going to bomb Moscow on the anniversary. I mean, if you're so impartial, shouldn't you at least say right that Zelensky was going to bring us on the verge of world war three that seems pretty fair while julian assange rots in prison all of you got you know fat checks because he's in jail for doing your job and you know what tucker carlson ain't no seymour hirsch but he did something you guys are scared to do speak the truth and actually be critical of the war which is why he was actually fired from fox because you are all cowards every single one of you none of you have actually had any relevancy and you know what the mainstream press is now dying nobody's ever going to listen to you again you have no credibility with the public the only people who care about what you have to say are elite assholes who have nothing productive to say yeah. anymore and it's dying off so will you at least say something either about Nord Stream or Ukraine or the fact that Zelensky brought us to the verge of World War III and the only reason we knew about that was through leaks I, I'm go ahead it's a free speech event right you guys are the press let's say something here <laughs> Mr. Khan come on you know you're the executive head of the New York Times you know I'm just trying to get into some good trouble here, man. Woo. Listen, Karen, get out of my face for a second. I got to talk to these gentlemen. <clears throat> well, I just want to hear what they have to say. Go ahead. I'm done. Wait your turn. Wait your turn. You're not going to tell them to you. Wait your turn. You could you could project if we can't. I'm just having some fun to hear everybody's point of view. Yeah. So thank you. All right. I do think that we need to give. Uh, 
our moderator a chance to ask other questions. We're on the verge of World War Three. Say something about this bombing. We blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Listen, don't stand there while there are people rotting in prison. Nobody said anything about Uhuru, right? The socialists who are in jail for being critical of this war. God damn it. At least say something about the people in jail for being critical of this war. They don't deserve to be in prison right now. All right. So there's oh, that was entertaining. Way, way to go, Jose. Bravo. <laughs> Bravo, you. my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Way to go. That was great, man. That was great. Thank you. What thank happened you for... outside the door? What did they do to you when they got you outside? Well, the thing is, is that the whole audience, the speakers and the people who dragged me out were all Bud Light drinkers. So you oh, know, oh, it was oh. easy to fight them off, you know, because they're all full of soy. No. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. Wait, was that at Columbia? Uh, Jose, where was that? Yeah, so that was at Columbia School of Journalism. And right, actually, right, the guy right. who pushes me down is the dean of Columbia School of Journalism, no. Jelani Cobb. No. Yeah. Oh, and, my God. And afterwards, I do have audio up on the Twitter now. It was like the last thing I posted on it. Um, I put up uh, the audio afterwards. So you, what you hear is you hear me panting. And then uh, I tell the guy, because he's bear hugging me, like, tight. To, and yeah. so I tell him, hey, listen, my heart's beating kind of fast. It's hard to breathe. You know, can you loosen up your grip? Mm. And he says, no, I don't trust you. Right. So and then I okay. say, come on, man, like, I can't breathe here. You know, you're choking me. You're damn near choking me. Is what I said, he says, I'm not choking you. I'm calm. And I say, I'm calm, too. Then we get in the elevator and then he finally lets me go once the elevator is moving. And then uh, he says, you're not going to come here and interrupt my event. And I say, why not? And he says, well, because it's my event. Right. And I say, oh, well, excuse me, yeah, yeah, yeah. your we highness, know. my, my apologies. Right. I didn't mean to, to, to interrupt your event. I will leave pronto. And then as I leave, I say, that was fun. So you can hear all this in the audio. Oh, very good. I'm going to have you go tune into that after the show. We'll put up your Twitter feed. Uh, yeah, on sure. Twitter account. Wow. So, we, dude, I mean, we saw the AOC one. Was that a couple of months before? I mean, what's the timeline of these two events? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, the AOC one. Oh, you guys played that in the beginning. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We went full Vega. <laughs> <laughs> now, to go full Vega, you'd need to play all 11 or 12, I think, that have oh, gone viral. Oh, yeah. wow. I but, didn't know. Oh, Zay. Yeah, yeah. No, I've I've got quite a resume now on, on like a lot oh, of these. You have people. to take a look at this. I have a whole weekend uh, fun. We should, yeah, you could probably string them along in one Netflix thing. But the AOC one was October 13th or 14th, I think. It was, I, the only reason I know that date exactly is because my girlfriend broke up with me the day after. Well, who Ooh, could blame her? She loved AOC and her makeup and everything <laughs> else. Come on. You were pushing your luck there, Vega. Come on. Yeah, so. Dude, where are you uh, from? You're from the Bronx? I am from the Bronx, born and right. raised here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm from Brooklyn. So I mean, I, I worked for about 12 years for the Village Voice as an investigative reporter. So wow, it's a play out in LA for the LA Weekly, which is the sister publication for the Voice. Um, okay. But I grew up in Brooklyn and Manhattan, the Upper West Side. So um, I assume you're a Yankee fan up there in that area of the country. So let's not get into political stuff. Okay? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to bring that up, but. But nevertheless, how'd you get involved in this stuff? Yeah, so the, yeah, well, it was actually even before the AOC one. Um, my very first intervention that got big was when I confronted Kamala Harris in 2021 um, oh, in October. Wow. This was this was before the war in Ukraine had broken right, out. Right. And here in Queens, we had eight people die because of some hurricane that, that, um, had come by and the truth is is that new york city knew that the neighborhood where those people flooded because they mm -hmm. died in their own homes and oh, it wasn't wow. that the water seeped in it was that the water was coming up from the toilets and people lived in basement apartments oh. so they couldn't right. get out right. they literally drowned to death in their own apartment and so here comes kamala harris talking about build back better right mm. which doesn't address any infrastructure needs for the city at all so i confronted her and i said you know um uh, what did I, I forgot what, oh, oh, cause she was talking about families and families and this will benefit mm. families. And I said, what about the families who drowned? Eight people died here in Queens and it could have been prevented if we had the right infrastructure. And so, uh, the newspapers called me the Harris heckler. Um, mm. 
my it's a nice identity. alliteration. Oh, that's interesting. The Harris Heckler. Wow. Harris Heckler. Yeah. I mean, really, like. I hear you're going to tour with Charlemagne the God and a, uh, <laughs> and a Kamala Harris heckling duo, but I, that might be just rumor. No, that'd be great. That'd be funny. But no, if you want, like, my ultimate motivation for why I do this and I call out all these politicians, I mean, you know, we have an extensive list, you know, and it's also, it's, it would be Republicans too if there were more of them here. You know, some of these guys are just straight up war hawks and neocons, like Mike Pompeo. I drove up to Yale just to go and heckle him, uh, you know, um, uh, and, and I, look, don't get me wrong. I'm not some Democrat. I'm not a leftist. I'm also not a Republican either. I don't I don't like. Well, how would you right. describe yourself as, as a anti-war populist? As an American citizen. And that's I, a good, I that's, as, well, we have different hats. So we wear, you know, sometimes we wear different. No, hats. I, I really do. mean. What is the Declaration of Independence? Right. When government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish the government. I mean, I agree. I, I, agree. I believe that. And I am right a patriot. You know, right I, on, bro. Do, I love the Declaration of Independence. I love the Constitution. And I think the government we've had for the last 20 years, you could argue the last 40 years, but I'm 24. So right. all I've known, we, we like we take it back to '63 in November, where something bad happened to a guy's head. <laughs> so yeah, take, right. no, I'm sorry, I take it a little yeah. further back, but yeah, I agree with you. I agree. Yeah, with right. You. Well, there you go. Right. You know, the kind of government you've had is not the United States. That is not America. That that is this is fascism. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know people like to call it communism. Some people like to call it Marxism. I don't care whatever you dress it up as. The point is, it's not America. Right. And I think every single person's civic duty right now is to stand up and take back your government. I mean, right, right. you know, and, yeah. and the way to do that is, you know, do what you just saw me do there. There are 435 congressional districts. Can we find one person in each to do them? Do I, I've been saying that on this show since we started. I agree with you 100 percent. I mean, there has to be a time when you throw yourself on the machine like Mario Savio described at Berkeley in 1966 or become so odious and so malicious and so nefarious that you have to stop the machine from functioning, whether you, what do you bring your own microphone and amp with you? What's no. the deal there? <laughs> <laughs> the reason you can hear me so clearly is because I coordinate with my friends at later. So like mm. if I have, I also wrote a whole guide on this too, which okay, is I, I need that guide. We That's need what that. we need. We need the guide, it's, bro. It's available on rageagainstwar.com. Uh, okay. I, I, you know, I wrote it from like why you should do this to how you should do this to, you know, how to find what to say and also how to find events so people can go find that there. But, um, right on. you know, I had two other of my friends. So what that means is we have one guy who's in front of us recording. Then we have the guy who's closer to me who's backup recording just in case the first guy fails. And then right. I... I'm not holding a microphone. I'm holding my phone, which is recording my audio. And then later I sync them together, which is why you can hear me clearly. But actually, the room was pretty small enough that on the raw video, you could hear me clearly. Right. So, it, it sounds like Apollo 11 you got going there with all different <laughs> kinds of technical no, uh, situations. Yeah, it's like Apollo 11 you got going. Bro. Who are your influences? I'm, I'm curious about that. I mean, you're doing it. It's, it's obviously a flashback from Mark and his ilk what inspired you to take this course and have you followed anyone or seen anyone that influenced you to say, Hey, you know what? I want to take this action. Yeah, man. Well, you know, you ready to get a flashback from the past. You know, uh, I'm a LaRouche organizer. I, mm -hmm. with Lyndon LaRouche, you know, I go, um, I, I came across their organization when they were out in Manhattan, when I was like 15 years old and they had these posters of Obama with a Hitler stash. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember that. Who's the Senate candidate you're endorsing up from? Diane Sayre. Diane where, Sayre. Where is she from? Like Oneonta or something? Where she's from pretty far up there, right? Uh no, 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 no. Diane is originally from Maine, but now oh, oh, she, well, that's pretty far up, bro. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's really but, far up. But she's she's running for Senate here in New York. She ran against Chuck Schumer as an independent last ah, year. Ah, okay, gotcha. Okay. And now she's running against Kirsten Gillibrand. She was also a, a LaRouche organizer. I mean you know, th those guys have a reputation of doing this kind of stuff. The only difference is that we have social media now, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. I think I've been able to kind of like use social media. And also, you know, I have to give props to Elon Musk. I mean, whatever people might think of him, 
I don't think this video would have gone as big as it did if Twitter was still controlled by, right, right. you know, some of the yep. previous owners. Yes. Um, I think Musk lifting a lot of the restrictions have allowed it to to go as big as it did. And other influences other than my own organizations. I mean, you know, stuff that Code Pink does like Medea Benjamin with these kinds of she just did one the other day where she got I saw that. I, right. I saw that one where they were dragging her off the stage <laughs> uh, with what's his name from The Washington Post that. Uh, uh, spook journalist who's been there for years. The old I know guy. what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I just forget his name right now, but he's one of the older foreign policy guys there. And that guy actually defended Julian Assange too. You know, did I thought so? I thought so. Yeah, yeah. He had actually wrote an article saying something like, "Listen, maybe he did do something wrong, but what we're charging him with does not hold up, and it's wrong to hold him in prison." Um, right. That that was the article he had written, but you know, Medea Benjamin also studying my history. You know, Eugene Debs is like big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy went to jail, okay, yep. protesting war. Right. And then Daniel Ellsberg, of course. I mean, you know. Well, we had on we had on Michael Tracy last week when we were talking about Daniel Ellsberg versus this uh, whistleblower up in Massachusetts who released the uh, documents from the Pentagon about the Ukraine war going badly. And oh, yeah. was, the kid who was in the National Guard up in Massachusetts, Jose, and Michael said there's different type, there's legitimate whistleblowers and there's illegitimate whistleblowers. Yeah, that and was had, interesting. That was very interesting. He said that this kid was an illegitimate whistleblower. And if he had played his cards right and gone to The Washington Post like a real whistleblower, they would have embraced him instead of hunting him down like a dog and turning them over to the FBI. The final part, that's my... He editorial. got confused, though, when we brought up um, Bradley Manning, a.k.a. Chelsea Manning. And, right, right. Well, he, he, couldn't said, well, he couldn't explain... Uh, she's he, sort yeah. of illegitimate, but good illegitimate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he got, he, got to, he got kind of tongue-tied over Manning's uh, legitimacy. I, I, I will say this. like I love Michael Tracy. I don't agree with, with um, some stuff he says. You know, he And he also likes to stoke the flames sometimes. Right. He, said he brought up RFK Jr.'s voice and speech impediment, and he got oh. a lot of hate for that i just want to say this publicly like michael tracy like i still love you anyway so i okay. hope you know you, right. you take well, what i'm I... about to say with with like you know i i disagree i mean yeah well to be honest though the 21 year old kid as far as like the official story goes he was just looking for some clout in whatever gaming server he was yeah. in yeah, yeah you know by posting like hey look i got like top secret documents yeah regardless though the persecution after him was completely unfair and like right what you know oh it's okay to go after whistleblowers as long as they didn't leak it to us first i mean why did the New York Times and Bellingcat spend so much time and resources trying to like, oh, look at the tile on that kitchen matches with something posted on Instagram a few years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they were yeah, really yeah. like doing the FBI's job for them. That's, like, what, what? that's what we were saying. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, Tracy seemed to think that this kid was not a legitimate whistleblower that El Ellsberg was. I mean, I, I don't get it. I don't understand the logic behind it because. I mean, uh, you know, what about this guy? What was the guy's name, uh, Eric, from Ukraine, who leaked the phone call between Zelensky and Trump? Oh, Vindman. 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 He was but considered. That doesn't a... count. He, no, but <laughs> Tracy didn't even count him. He was like, oh, well, that was part of uh, such a. It, it's that very was a selective. weird explanation. Yeah, that was a weird. And then the Manning one. I mean, look, I mean, if why is Assange in jail if not for Bradley Manning? Why is, you know, I mean, where where would the, the WikiLeaks thing be without Manning? You know, I mean, what is yeah. the status? What is the legal status of Julian Assange? What is his legal status? Nobody can seem to answer that freaking question, Jose. It's well, isn't the official thing he's awaiting trial? Right. OK, right. so he's awaiting what? like January 6th. Yeah, like he's awaiting what trial in England or de deport deportation here? I mean, you know, what yes. is it, bro? I mean, how many decades can this go on? This political prisoner farce. Well, what it really is is they're just going to try and kill him because the know, official charge, right? The official yeah. charge is what Espionage Act, which right. he's which not even Which is what this American. kid is being charged with up in Massachusetts. Yeah, that's that's why you see, but and and um. Yeah, no, the whole leaks thing, though, was really weird because even then I'm still kind of like, I think the poor kid probably fell into some kind of trap or something where these yeah. leaks were yeah. some kind of controlled leak and the poor kid was just some patsy. By the way, his stepfather was military intelligence by his own admission out of that National Guard regiment. I don't know what his relationship is to his stepfather. Mine wasn't so good, but I don't know if my dad would <laughs> blow the whistle on me and turn me over to the feds, but who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah.
there you go, right? Like, yeah, right. Maybe the stepfather just didn't. Maybe like he didn't like kid. the kid. Yeah, yeah. He was like wanted to bang the mom and get the yeah, kid out I mean, of there. Right? You're the like, one talking about banging his mom. I didn't bring it up, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of banging and uh, somebody else you encountered, um, you had your encounter with AOC. <laughs> Um, I was wondering yeah. what you think of like um, from I, I'd say almost the other side or of the aisle, but Alex Stein, who kind of is a comic protester. Do you have any thoughts on? I love that? Alex Stein. I think he's hilarious. I think what him and I do, there is no discord. I think it's very there, funny. Yeah, he's very good a, at it. And actually, when I confronted Nancy Pelosi, I was trying to kind of channel, channel a little bit of Alex Stein. You guys might have seen this one and just not known it was me. Somebody called Nancy Pelosi a saddle drunk. Oh, yes. <laughs> Bravo, my friend. Bravo. Yeah, right. So, you know, like Alex Stein goes like completely in the comedic section. I try to just kind of like, undr like it's different for every person, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, for Nancy Pelosi, she's just going to get ridiculed. Right. right. Completely. Right. You know, so I just said, I came to see a warmonger, but you're just a sad old drunk. Yeah. And uh, wow. uh, uh, so I love what Alex Stein does completely. Um, it's completely synonymous with what I do. It's just, you know, different methods of it. You know, um, the point is to ridicule the so-called authorities because they're not authorities. They're, they, they I, don't. I, I completely agree with you. My background is I was editor of National Lampoon magazine for many years. In, in oh, yeah. In the 80s. So I understand about ridiculing power because uh, that's what we did as an institution. So um, I appreciate your work. Yeah. No. Wow. That's cool. There you go. So then you understand exactly what I'm doing. See, no, no, I do. I mean, you're, you're, you're doing the physicality of what we did in writing, which is a beautiful thing. Yeah, exactly. And so that's why I have no problem with Alex Stein. In fact, he reached out to me when I did the AOC one and he just told me, hey, good job, man. And like at that point, I had shared his. Um, his raps that he does at the these town halls mm, about like, mm. COVID or, right? dude those town halls are unbelievable i, I mean they're great. they, they they're just great. sit there like they don't know the guy and he's been in there a hundred times and they go alex stein here again you, you know i mean it's just i i i can't believe that he yeah. keeps going to the same place yeah freedom of speech man yeah, first yeah, amendment yeah. he's in yeah. there a lot of time you know he can he can do what he wants but speaking of which you know aoc now has done her last two town halls completely virtual. Oh, Shocking, of course, of course. Of course. Bravo yeah. Vega. Did Bravo she start? Did she start crying and saying that she was under threat? And uh, oh my God, you know things might happen. I don't know what her reasoning is, but I'm hoping the more I keep bringing it up, the more she'll be like, "That's not true. We were just doing it because we needed virtual, and we're going to go back to doing physical just to spite you." It's like, okay, okay, uh, bring it I, back, I, bring it I back, bitch. So. Let's go, bring your makeup. Let's roll. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, she, uh, the the response to that one also went. It wasn't as big as this one because this one was huge. I mean, the one with the New York Times people. Mm. I mean, this one got translated into like Ooh. six or seven different other languages. I mean, I saw subtitles in Russian, Chinese, right. Spanish, German, right. and French. Um, and I've had people from around the world messaging me. You know, saying like, thank you for doing this. You know, your mainstream media lies all the time, and that's all people read over here. And you know, that was good. And I'm and I'm and I'm just there, like, yeah. But when I confronted AOC, I remember the first thing she tried to do the day after it went super viral was she tried to deflect and say, Oh, you guys spoke because it was me and my friend, you guys spoke over a deaf constituent. How dare you? <laughs> and as you Jimmy Dore, <laughs> Jimmy, <Wow>. Jimmy Dore. <laughs> Jimmy Dore pointed out, like, how many deaf people are actually coherent enough to, to be heard and speak on a microphone, first of all. Right. And secondly, he said, um, if there was a deaf constituent, would they even care? Because would they be even be able to hear right. what was happening? You know, and uh, uh, but no, there was no deaf constituent. She just made that up. What it was was. Wasn't what she was. hiding out during January 6th in the building or something? She That's was what I was lying. talking about. And then she uh, yeah. did the Instagram thing about, I was under threatened because I have been <laughs> physically, and I can't use terms because it's YouTube, but it, right, yeah, right. she just went into this whole bit with her, in between putting on makeup. Yeah. Um, it, <laughs> it, Dude, I thought right. that was Dean Beckett, but that was a guy named Khan, you're, you're saying, at the Khan, New York Times. Cobb. No, oh, no, well, who no, was no, the no, guy, the, the New York the, Times no, guy, no, I would no, say. No, no, I thought that I couldn't see. The New York Times guy is Joe Kahn, the executive editor of the New York Times. He just gotcha. took over, I think, like last year or something or two okay. years. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. I thought Dean Beckett was sitting up there. No, he 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 put his uh he he resigned or something. Oh, oh, so, he's gone. He's gone, yeah. right? 
Well, or, or I think he still might be at the New York Times, just not as their executive editor. Oh, I got you. Okay, because he was here in L.A. He was a L.A. Times guy for a while until they ran him out of town. <laughs> then he disappeared into the Caribbean, resurfaced uh, back at the New York Times out of the blue a couple of years oh, wow. later. Yeah, yeah really sketchy. sketchy at all. Really sketchy cat. Really no, that sketchy makes sense cat. to me. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's Caribbean. a real sketchy dude, bro. Real yeah, sketchy sure. dude. Maybe it was at Epstein's Island. You know, so much. Well, check that come on. Somebody should go back there and see what's going on. <laughs> yeah, what's going now, on? Everybody, there today? everybody but me and Hunley and you are the only three that haven't been on Epstein's Island. Uh, you know, it seems socialist. like everybody. I mean, everybody's been there. <laughs> Well, maybe yeah. it's just me and maybe it's me and Hunley. I don't know what you're doing. Oh maybe. yeah, there, that's true. I mean, Even yeah. looking, Noam Chomsky was just there. The Chomsky day. was there. Chomsky had his own room. That's crazy. Yeah, I saw this thing on Twitter that said, "Imagine you're at Epstein's Island for a satanic orgy, and then Noam Chomsky is just in the corner talking about how militarism is bad." Right. Like, right. come on, read the room, Noam. You know, read, read the room. <laughs> I mean, they called it Linguists Island for before. Oh. <laughs> He was cunning to go down there, Chomsky, but. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what was I even saying? Oh, yeah, the AOC. I don't know. It's Freeform Friday. We could do anything here on yeah, Friday. You gotta... so just roll with it, Jose. <laughs> well, just to finish the point on the AOC thing. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. what it was, was it was an email that came in about how do we make politics more accessible for people with disabilities like <laughs> those that are deaf? And Kynan intentionally stood up there on purpose because nobody was at the microphone, right? So they were reading an email question while people were still thinking or, or while they were still deciding what to do next with the town hall, right? Because the, the place was barely attended. Um, mm, right. And so that's why Kynan then stood up and did his thing. So then three days after that didn't work and it was just kept getting bigger and bigger, she put out a whole thing on Instagram talking about how Kynan and I are right-wing Trump supporters, cult Damn. members. Damn. Who, Nobody should take seriously. This is all they do. They're just looking for attention, and everything wow. they said is wrong. And nobody wow. should listen. To that. And then that only made the video go even bigger. No, <laughs> what is that? The Streisand effect, Eric? Yeah, <laughs> literally, right? What is that? The Streisand effect? Oh, for sure. By, by the way, on that note, I'm I'm curious because you really present extremely well. Before you go in, do you have? like uh, outlines in your head or basic scripts because you have a limited amount of time, you want to get a message across. How do you plan for delivering your message? I'm curious. Recently, um, we've been trying to do zingers. So we do one-liners that we build off of, right? Um, so like I took a little bit of an improv class in high school and college or for the one semester I went to college. And then I also took like a writer's workshop in comedy. Um, mm. and so the stuff you want that sells is like, you know, your punchline or stuff that can be quoted. Mm -hmm. So combining that with the social media stuff, because what we see often is people who rip our videos and then repost it on their own page without crediting us, which is fine with me because I'd rather have other people inspired and not know who I am, then take the credit. So that's mm -hmm. that's A-OK -okay with me. But what we see them do is they'll take like a quote that I say, and then put that on on like the, the attention grabber, right? As the title for people to come and watch the, the thing, right? So like when I say like, you know, nobody's gonna, you know, take your, nobody, no, the public will, does not trust you anymore. Whatever I said there, right? A lot of people were quoting that, right? Hmm. Um, and that's exactly the kind of thing we want. We wanna try and create lines that are headliners while also then building off the substance of what we were saying, right? So I would say maybe like 70 to 80% of what was there was like just, you know, straight off the dome. Um, and then the bullet points, I was like, okay, well, I do need to get Julian Assange in there and I need to get mm -hmm. Seymour Hersh in there and let's throw Tucker Carlson in there and I'll see how I figure it out as I go. So you, you, you're you're opposed, you, I'm okay. sorry, you're opposed to the closing of Nordstrom's clothing store from what you yelled at. <laughs> from what I understand. Listen, if you want to see some interesting comedy, I, I you might want to take a look at something I produced called Mambo Mouth with John Leguizamo a number of years ago for HBO. You might like that. As oh yeah, a, as a Latin man, yeah, I think you might okay. enjoy. It. Sure. Check out check out John as a comedian because that was at the peak of his uh, comic abilities in that show, Mambo Mouth. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Okay, you okay so you're, you're, you're. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Eric. I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. Do you try to keep everything tight though? Also for the misquoting aspect, like if you go on too long with a line, it can be chopped up 
and reused in a way against you. But if oh. everything's short and punchy, like four words, five words, etc., every part that they grab is useless or it's a full thought on its own. I'm just curious if you put thought into that. No, actually, what I'm afraid of is over explaining. Like, I don't want to just start going through and Seymour Hersh's article on page two, paragraph right, three. Right, he details right. how the world's best Navy. Thought, you know, I don't need to do right. all that. Right. Right. Um, that's what I'm afraid of. Has that happened, though? Once, actually, when I confronted Richie Torres, uh, my congressman, that one also I was, I was going to say he's from the Bronx, Torres, right? Yeah, yeah, he's from the Bronx. Yeah, he's right, my but do you district. do you live? Okay, I'm sorry because you don't live in Queens, but you went to AOC's district. No, well, she held it here in the Bronx. I mean, because oh, okay, AOC because her is, district overlaps. Yeah, right. Uh, it's Just to explain, district. if you can explain it to the people at home. So um, AOC's district is like sixty percent Bronx and forty percent right. Queens. If you want Northern to pull Queens. up the city map, yep. you'll see there is like a, a connection there. Um, and so AOC's town hall was in the Bronx. Um, yeah, but Richie Torres, what he did, this idiot, you, you know, he's feuding with George Santos. Um, so, you know, I guess it's like a gay thing or something where they're... No, no. <laughs> like, well, well anyway. Uh, no, because you'll see, like, they're because they're both part of the... Hey, I, I'm an ally, and I should just you know, put that out there. I am an ally, and... But you see the way they both go at each other. Like, Richie Torres often goes after George Santos because they're both New York congressmen. Right. And so what Richie Torres did was he took my intervention against him and he completely cut out everything I did. And he only kept in his response where he was calling Putin Hitler. And so uh, what George Santos did was he took my intervention, reposted it on his Twitter and said, hey, Richie Torres, uh, rough reception at home, buddy. To which then Richie Torres responded, oh, wow, you know, you should know about lies. Maybe that's why you like this video, because it's all full of lies. That was when the Nord Stream um, explosion had just, uh, excuse me, the Nord Stream revelations had just come out. And Richie Torres was the uh, first guy I had actually confronted on the Nord Stream um, pipeline blowing up. And so um, I, uh, I, uh, yeah, and, and, and I remember George Santos just, and them just having a back and forth, like, like they really were just like two guys just having this like cat fight about who's more of a liar with my intervention in the middle. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So crazy. I mean, so, on, on a side note, on a side note, how is the fentanyl crisis impacting the Bronx? Wait, hold on. Nate the lawyer, you're in you're yeah, in the Bronx? He's one of our guys, yeah. Nate the lawyer. Nate, no way. I, I've been watching Nate's stuff. Oh man, it goes back to like the I think it was either the Kavanaugh. Or even that kid, the uh, the one with the rifle, and he took Kenosha. You remember that? Rittenhouse. Man, yeah, oh Rittenhouse, man, yeah. Rittenhouse. Everybody was watching that. Yeah, and that's when I uh, followed uh, Nate too, because I was like wanted to grab everybody's uh, you know take on what that was. So that's that's awesome. Um, I'm sorry, I I fentanyl Bronx. Sorry, to no, no. We're talking about fentanyl in the Bronx. Just to digress a, a little bit towards some local situations there. How is the fentanyl impact up in the Bronx? If you could see any, you know, I'm so glad you bring that up. Because, That's why like, I'm here, brother. That's why I'm here. <laughs> I had confronted Espayat back in January. Now right this on. one didn't go viral, but it went. It was not not viral, viral, but it went viral in New York. Yeah, because yeah. I had a lot of New Yorkers messaging me this. I confronted Espayat on that issue. So he was like getting some kind of award ceremony back in January. And explain, who that, explain who that is for people. Adriano Espayat is a congressman who deals with Harlem up to Washington Heights and a little bit of the Bronx and Riverdale, the rich right. part of, of the Bronx. And he also happens to run the same district that belonged to Charlie Rangel. Mm -hmm. Before Charlie Rangel, it was um, Powell, uh, Adam, Adam Clayton Adam Powell. Adam Clayton Powell the third, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, Adriana Espayat is no Adam Clayton Powell. And when I was doing <laughs> pet petitioning for Diane Sayre at, um, in Harlem, I rem you can like, you just really it's like stand on 125th Street and Lenox Avenue, mm -hmm. right by the Whole Foods. There's mm -hmm. cops. And then right next to the cops, maybe like a good 15, 20 feet, you will have underage kids dealing drugs right in front of them. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're just watching this. The cops don't care. They're, they're just letting them do it. And mm -hmm. the kids are arguing about who's going to sell to which bum next. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you have people who are slumped over. OK, like literally like they're folded in half like zombies just in the middle of the street. There are streets in Harlem where there are people who are just like 
like like straight up zombies. Okay, so the drug problem, Adriano Espaillat actually opened it and allowed and put in the policy for open air drug trading because right. there was some kind of deal that was had in the mid two thousands where the cops basically said, okay, we won't prosecute and we won't go after some of these open air drug traders. So every morning at Whole Foods, you can see, and it's also old people too, who are all, they just have these little tiny wrappers of whatever drug is in there, right? Mm -hmm. They all trade it and then they go away, they disperse, right? And I would see this every morning petitioning in April to, to May, uh, or May to, yeah, May to June. I was, I was seeing this and I was just like, this is happening in front of our eyes, nobody's doing anything. And you know what the worst part was? I remember one time, it was like four o'clock. I was doing pretty bad that day because we weren't getting the signatures we needed. There was mm. some guy slumped over in front of me. And then there was another guy just recording this guy, an older guy, mm. just recording him. And so I'm looking at this. And then the guy who's recording the guy slumped over comes to me and says, excuse me, uh, I don't know much about these cell phones. Can you uh, help me share this to my son? Mm. And I said, sure, no problem. So he... You know, I, I send it to his son through his phone. And he says, thank you. You see that guy right there? That's my other son. Oh. Okay? oh, oh and I'm showing oh, my younger son oh, what wow. his older brother is doing so he doesn't become that. I was bawling wow, in tears because wow. he said, come on, son, let's go. And he grabbed him by the oh, arm while no. he was still slumped over. No. Walking, and tried to pick him up and try and keep whatever semblance of dignity he had. Mm. Okay. So mm. all of that in mind, I go to Adriano Espaillat's award ceremony for being a great congressman. And I say, oh, yeah, great congressman. Really? Harlem is still messed up. People are slumped over on 125th Street. OK, mm -hmm. open air drug trading. And you brought us on the brink of World War Three. You've done nothing right as a congressman. And so, you know, that's that's the drug problem here in the city right now. Worse than ever. And it's just as bad. Wow. Wow. I had no idea it had gotten that bad. You know, I rely on Nate's reports coming out of the Bronx. You know, you have to rely on Nate. You know, you may not get the entire story. Is but, this all uh, Trank that we're talking about here or is that yet another subject? No, I mean, what? no, this what he's talking about is 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 fentanylized heroin that's that's killing people in the Bronx. I mean, this is a Russian roulette situation where every single drug in the Bronx and in Harlem has been laced with fentanyl or created out of whole fentanyl out of corporations that Tony Blinken now says in the State Department that the Chinese Communist Party has nothing to do with it. today. He said it's private companies in China that are shipping the fentanyl here. Like it makes a difference. <laughs> it makes a difference where it's coming from in China. It's being sent to the United States to drug over the United States to drug cartels in Mexico and possibly even to the Caribbean and then shipped to the Bronx, probably on the East Coast and the West Coast out of Mexico drug cartels to explain the physicality of the distribution. Okay, I asked about Trank because I literally just learned about this very recently, and they were talking about how Narcan doesn't stop it. It, it If you OD, you're dead. It, it's just... Um, well, it's I like mean, Narcan's not, gonna, yeah, Narcan's not going to work quickly with fentanyl either. I mean, fentanyl is so powerful that it, it's one one hundred... Heroin is one one hundredth the power of fentanyl. And fentanyl, when you buy heroin, they might, you don't know the amount of fentanyl that's in there. And people are, you know, are using heroin with fentanyl and getting away with it, saying, you know, so what? I used heroin with fentanyl. I mean, in two seconds, you could be dead from fentanyl. In fact, EMS workers in L.A. are passing out from just handling people on fentanyl, from the you know from the fumes or the contact of fentanyl, that's how powerful it is. Jesus wow. Christ! So I mean, the Congress people, I mean, you got to stay on them about this fentanyl crisis up there in the Bronx and in Harlem because uh, the Biden administration seems to have turned a blind eye to this particular drug problem. Well, look, you know, I mean, the, the problem with the drugs is that it's very much tied to the economy and the GDP, which people like to use as a measure for a good economy, right? When people say, oh, well, the GDP is very high. You know, most of that money is drug money and illegal money and some kind of derivatives, oh, that's a good right? That's there a good is a there's a famous picture of the ex-head of the New York Stock Exchange hugging 
a Colombian drug cartel lord, okay? Why? Because they're in sync. The whole thing's in sync, right? Wall Street launders and washes the money that these drug dealers make. If you want to stop the drug trade, you got to stop Wall Street. Mm. I, I I mean that. And see, that's why I brought up es Espaillat's a perfect example, because Espaillat and Schumer are some of the two leading Democrats who have put those policies, those economic policies in place that have allowed drugs to completely run rampant in the community because they don't care about, oh, we need to legalize all drugs because we're liberals. No, it's we need to legalize all drugs so we can save our fucking collapsing economy. Let right? me tell you something. The digital currency of America is drugs. What do you mean by that? Well, they want to switch to a digital currency in America. You know, I know that, yeah. Right. I'm saying we already have a type of digital currency. It's called drug narco dollars. That is the digital currency of the United mm. States and has been for a number of years. It, it is the major poor ground currency that is unregulated, untapped and untouched. And if they can digitize that, it might be a way, I don't know, maybe by accident to do something about the underground economy in terms of narcotics. Yeah, wow, actually. It might be right. That. I mean, think that's, about that's, it. That's, that's, it that's, might be an unintended consequence of something that we, none of us seem to support. Yeah, I might bring that back to some of my people who know way more about the drugs. Yeah, the yeah, I mean, that's I just do. an idea that popped into my head. But think about it. It might, be, it might have some unintended consequences that we don't know about in the good side. Not that I support digital currency, but I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, uh, report to the WEF now. No, no, <laughs> stop it. I, I don't work for them. Come on. Go my eat uncle, your bugs. My uncle, Klaus Schwab, you know, just keeps talking <laughs> me about this show. You know, we're not related. Um, oh, okay. You look just like him. Right. I talked to yeah. a guy this week, by the way. I did an interview with a guy named Dr. Reiner Fulmich. I don't know if you people know who this guy is. He is a guy who, a uh, German uh, 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 do doctor who is putting COVID vaccines on trial uh, he tried to in europe but he couldn't find a court to actually put the pharmaceutical companies on trial in europe he's now hooked up and we'll possibly have him on the show later on in the, in, the, in the month he now has hooked up with the maori indians in new zealand with their court system they have agreed to put the pharmacy international pharmaceutical companies on trial under the uh, uh, rubrics of the Maori Indian court system in New Zealand. So there's mm -hmm. going to be, I'll follow up on this a little later. I spoke to him on the phone yesterday. He went down to Peru to interview uh, another anti-pharmaceutical -pharma guy in Peru. And uh, he's now in Mexico and is not being allowed back into the United States by the U.S. government. This is uh, Dr. Fulmich, who has a ranch and, and house in Northern California and is a, uh, a German uh, scientist and lawyer, more of a lawyer than a doctor, but I think his doctorate's a PhD. But uh, Kira he, the Don, same situation. He's in Mexico, has oh. all the full rights and everything, but he's trapped in Mexico. Right, this guy's not, trapped in Mexico, he told me. back in. Right, uh, right, weird, yeah. weird. So, well, yeah, there's going to be more I, about that. But the fact that he hooked up with the Maori Indians uh, in, in New Zealand, uh, they have a court system like the Navajo nation does, Jose. You know what I mean? It's a separate nation within a nation. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's the Maoris in New Zealand. So I just found that to be of interest that they're going to put the pharmaceutical companies on trial there because he went to the international court in The Hague and was denied uh, having having uh, standing there. And well, you each know, Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I'm interested to see where that goes. But, you know, I mean, I'm I don't know what we're going to do, though, when it comes to, um, you know, vaccines and disease in the future. I mean, COVID was just a big flub in the United right. States. You right. Know? Right. And I remember my grandfather had a stroke when we were in the middle of lockdown and the ambulance came to my house and we my mom and I had to go to another room. And um, then no, no. And then they gave us like special N95 masks. Mm -hmm. And then those guys had like almost near hazmat suit level stuff. Then they put a big bubble over my grandfather. Then they were able to transfer him and we weren't able to visit him. And this wow. was a guy who didn't speak English. He didn't have his phone on him. Wow. We didn't know what the hell was like going on because we weren't allowed to visit him. We could call wow. in, but the hospitals here in New York, at least, were so over flooded and like everything was just so bad. Nobody was answering our calls. So I remember it was really bad. Um, what happens, though, in the future if you do get a disease that does kill people at, like, 
fifty percent mortality rate, you know, and people just aren't trusting of a vaccine. I mean, you know, has public trust in the government, not even pharmaceutical companies, the government eroded so much to where if when the next plague happens, because you know, I've done some studies on public health and like, you know, it's rooted in places like where I'm from in the Bronx here where, you know, these places are the epicenter for new mutations and new diseases because it's just so unsanitary here mm -hmm. and there's no public health here, you might actually get a disease at some point break out that could kill people. Has public trust just eroded so much? I mean, what's, what's well, the Well, it's, it's clearly taken a hit. I mean, there is no institution in America that is not taking a, taking a hit during this COVID epidemic. I mean, every, the newspapers, TV, CDC, FDA, uh, FCC. I mean, there is no institution that was not uh, WHO, United Nations. I mean, go, go down the list, Jose, of institutions that had high public approval in the 1990s and see where that public approval is and trust issues for those institutions today. You will probably see a 50 to 60 point drop in public approval of most American institutions today. Yeah, and I, I, oh, oh, we were gonna say something, Eric? No, I'm just sitting here. Oh, my bad. I, I thought you opened your mouth. And I just thought things were going to come out of me. Uh, no, uh, no, never yeah. expect. He does that. It's, a, it's, the hun, it's the Hunley fake out where you think he's going to say something. <laughs> he doesn't say. I don't know. I don't know. I just, I like to think you can rebuild trust in the government because, you know, right now people don't trust the government and they shouldn't. They should not. Like I'm. I, well, let right me now, give you, let me give an example. We have a woman out here named uh, Dr. Barbara Farrar, who is the health czar in Los Angeles County. There's 10 million people in Los Angeles County. She was fanatical on the lockdowns, fanatical on the masks. She had no oversight. She was not an elected official. She took down six hundred forty thousand dollars a year in salary. She's still the health czar of uh, Los Angeles County. And her director of communication, somebody suing her finally over this situation. So in the lawsuit, there was discovery this week. Documents were exchanged. And it turned out in the documents that her communications director was going after uh, people who were in the media who were speaking out against the mask and against COVID, one of them being mm -hmm. on ABC radio. And it turns out that that person, like uh, uh, Barbara Farrar, did not have a medical degree. She had a PhD in urban planning. That's why she was Dr. Farrar. She had no understanding of medical uh, procedures or pandemics. The second in command, who was a communications director, who was going after these people in the media, uh, used to work for a guy named Adam Schiff. So this is a... <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying it's not even funny. I mean, it's a politicized situation yeah. now, is what I'm trying to tell you. This is not a medical situation. This is a political situation. Yeah, right. She fought to the death every single person and outlet that criticized or attempted to rein her in because it was a political operation, not a medical operation. And I don't know how you restore faith in someone or some group or some institution that has no medical background, but a political agenda. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know, man. I'm just going to keep eating my bugs and drinking my Bud Light. And just Dude, I mean, you love those bugs anyway. When you were growing up, <laughs> you were eating those bugs anyway, bro. Okay, my father had those, uh, and I don't know why he was in there, because he, he used to take trips overseas, but he had chocolate-covered cockroaches in the refrigerator <laughs> and chocolate-covered ants in a can that was a commercial product from Nigeria or something. And we, me and my brothers would never go in there. We'd never touch those bugs, that were, even though they were chocolate-covered. No, I think, you know, honestly, like to restore public trust again in the government, you need the public in the government. I think yeah, yeah. that's not very difficult to figure out and do. And that's why I think, you know, if you see, I think it's not a matter of finding people you agree with on everything to run the government. It's a matter of finding people you can trust. And I've been saying, you know, we should build something. I mean, we're going to we're going to do this. I haven't written the manifesto for it yet. but. Mm -hmm which I know is a scary word, but I've been talking about this idea called the Coalition for a New Congress, mm -hmm. where you have 435 candidates, doesn't matter what they believe, as long as it's not something extreme or crazy, but basically who are all united under one principle. We need to restore public trust in government. We need to promote the general welfare. We need to go back to the principles of the Constitution and take back your government. This means you're going to have libertarians, you're going to have socialists, you're going to have everything in between those ideologies. And you know what? They're going to petition for each other, ballot for each other, mm -hmm. campaign under this one umbrella of coalition for a new Congress. 
And then they can fight out their ideas and ideologies in the Congress because that's real representation. You mm -hmm. have people in, 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 in the United States that believe all sorts of crazy things, but let that be represented in the Congress and let it be shown, right? Because then now you know your Congress is run by real people who you can trust and you can scream at them as much as you want, but you know at the end of the day, they will hear you out. And because they're real people, they might even change their minds. They might even mm -hmm. be willing and open to what you say. And I think yeah. doing it here in New York State might be the first place to do it. Dude, well, I've, a, I've had a similar idea called the Media Bill of Rights, um, which would prevent media from yelling fire in a crowded digital theater. You know, that, that we have to hold these people accountable in media Jose, for not lying and not doing certain things where there has to be some sort of uh, committee of people that can can hold these people accountable to uh, not running crazy crap 24 seven on cable news on either side of the aisle and hold them accountable to not lying and still retaining an FCC license, Jose. There's got to be a way and I'm calling it a media bill of rights. And I'd like you to think about that over the weekend and write me an essay by Monday if you can. <laughs> hey, he's and got chat GBT. Hey, chat GBT, <laughs> write me an essay. By, by the way, how about just removing breaking news from a cryon? No, 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 no. There's a million of these things. News. There's a million of these things. I mean, whether it's an, exacer an exaggeration of a weather pattern where you're saying thousands will die in this oncoming hurricane and nothing happens Name and people storms. have spent a fortune you know, boarding up their stores and everything, and they're exaggerating for, for ratings. That's just the tip of the iceberg. And I, I use that as, as a joke almost. I mean, there's all kinds of things that have been driving people to complete extremes, like picking up guns and going out and shooting people. It's almost like Orson Welles' War of the Worlds. When it broadcast yeah. in 19, 1939, there were people out there with shotguns in the Lincoln Tunnel, Jose, thinking the aliens were coming <laughs> from, from Jersey. Yeah, right. You know, not to knock New Jersey, but, you know, let's face it. No, knock New Jersey. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. To knock New Jersey, there's a lot of <laughs> aliens in New Jersey. And I don't want them coming through that tunnel. You know, I, but see, here's, well, here's some things, though. Like, well, like that that example you brought up, the hurricane's going to kill a thousand people, evacuate, evacuate, and then nothing happens. I mean, mm -hmm. we get that in New York City all the time. There's a Hurricane Maria, right? Was, right. Everybody was, you know, freaking out about it. And then it was just like gentle rain. The problem, though, is that sometimes things we think are true turn out to not be true, right? Mm -hmm. Should mm -hmm. people, I mean, that happens to all of us, you know? Should we all be held accountable because we thought something was right at the time, but then it turned out it wasn't? I mean, here's a, here's here's an argument for your case, specifically mm -hmm. WMDs right. in Iraq. Right. There's that, another one. Okay. But see, but see, that wasn't like, oops, we got that wrong. That was maliciously... Like I am going to scare you by saying it might be possible that the weather people are maliciously doing that for ratings. I know that sounds insane that no. you believed in weather people your whole life, but is it possible? And I'm using them as a mere example that they want to get ratings too, and they jack up this thing, and in a lawsuit during discovery, it may be revealed that they say fuck what people think. Let's just let's just max this thing out and get some ratings here, Bob, on this crazy weather pattern. I know that sounds insane, but what if it's true, Jose? I mean, I don't know. You look, man. You, can you believe anything coming out of your TV? I, no, I, I'm well, saying that half as a joke, half seriously. People, like, people do believe what comes out of their TV. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> we, we need a media bill of rights, whether it's a newspaper, not just TV. I'm talking about print and everything else that we've well, seen. Insane, insane stories coming out of institutional media in the past six years. I would say as long as you can prove it was malicious. Because like the WMD thing was just well, outrageous. The Russia Gate thing. Oh, the Hunter Biden laptop. Another one. That's a great, you know, support for your cause, right? Right. Because that was also obviously the stuff on there was true. Oh no, right. but these fifty retired officials say it's Russian disinformation. So just right. you know, cover your eyes. What, no, what I'm no. saying is there has to be a way post mortem, post mortem, to hold them accountable whether it's a tribunal, whether it's congressional hearings, whatever structure we have to come up with, we have to find a way to rein in this deranged media lying complex that well, has developed. Jose, I'm going to push back on the malicious that you said. Why do we have to prove it's malicious? Sometimes it's just the result. You know, I didn't mean to go get in the car drunk and run down three people. It wasn't malicious. But, you know, the people are still harmed. 
So maybe maybe there has to be some examples to get others to exercise caution ahead of time. I, yeah. I, I just wanted to put that out or or get you to consider. Well, you know, I mean, well, that's definitely you got me. You got me stumped there. But I think it depends on the severity of what happens, what the intention was, and the purpose. I mean, if you're driving drunk, that's just irresponsibility. You and you know, driving. Well, drunk, use your WMD example. Uh, I really thought they were that. Well, how many people died? Well, I yeah. didn't mean to. Here, here, have a, have but, a piece but of no, candy, but they Michelle did Obama. Mean to, though. But that's the difference. They did mean to mislead the public because the officials knew it was a lie, right? Ray McGovern confronted um, Rumsfeld on this in 2006, and Rumsfeld tried to get away with the, well, we thought it was. And then Ray McGovern says, um, actually, you said we have bulletproof. Right, I, you know, no, I agree with you. I mean, what are the consequences for Victoria Nuland saying we have these these weapons labs in the Ukraine that we don't want them to fall into Russian hands? I mean, wh where are the consequences to this woman, uh, Nuland, who has been involved in the toppling of the Ukrainian government by her own audio messages that were leaked? who's been involved in selecting a new leader in Kiev, a mayor, who's been involved in the, the Ukrainian war. I drove you, it really drove Vega off the page. Oh, yeah, no, CIA. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying there seems to be no consequences even today. I mean, you're, you don't have to go f that far back, Jose. Well, to, Victoria to... Newland should be in the gulag, all right? Right, okay. that's what I'm saying. But you, you, you don't have to go back to Rumsfeld. You got Newland five minutes ago, you know, doing this. <laughs> Good point. Look, I, I, you know, I think there's a there's a Shakespeare quote that says, you know, in the course of if thou seeks justice, you know, then we should all be damned, right? Um, it should be mercy that we all strive and pray for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't should, read. I didn't read that. There's a writer strike out here, so I didn't get. To <laughs> oh, is Shakespeare part of that too? Yeah, right? he's, he's on. He's part of the guild. He's part of the writers. Guild. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. And what I mean by that is like, look, like, can can we go after the media? Should we go after the government? Yes, completely. And the government is is look, the media is just stenographers for the government at this point. Right, but they're unregulated. Is what I'm trying to say. They they are the the reason they're using them is because they're untouchable. But I That's promise what... you, your audience, your audience probably doesn't read a single print that comes out of these establishments, and they rely on you. Now, right, but they, but they, they do media. indirectly read it because it gets translated into other publications, other things, it gets boiled sure. down. It's In other words, if I had a bodyguard that was untouchable legally, my bodyguard was able to kill, kick your ass, do everything, you know, kill you, whatever, the bodyguard was untouchable, I would use the bodyguard all day long. I would come along and say, yeah, screw Jose Vega, I got my bodyguard. <laughs> He's legally untouchable. That's the government's yeah. current relationship with the media. Yeah. I mean, that's what we saw in the Twitter files. They were using the Twitter files to dismantle uh, uh, leftist and rightist organizations, to go after both political groups, to to out them, listen to them, read their emails, look at their DMs. I mean, and with no consequences. Only... We can't have Elon Musk buying up every you know, media outlet in the country. That's not well, a solution. Well, there's your accountability, though. There is already accountability. It's just the people who are supposed to give it aren't giving it. That's yeah. the yeah, yeah. problem, right? Like. If you had an actual executive branch or, you know, the Congress, they're supposed to be a part of Congress actually doing. I mean, how many times did Jack Dorsey get his weirder and weirder looking ass dragged in front of Congress to just get yelled at and Zuckerberg yeah. and they all go, you know, you have Ted Cruz yelling at him, blah, 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 you're, you suck. And it's like, okay. And then they walk <laughs> out of there and then they do whatever the hell they want. Yeah. You know, look, government accountability. Well, well, dude, here you go. Here's here's a fascinating question, I think, for you and your audience. What do you do when the people who are supposed to deliver justice are the ones who are doing the injustice? That's a great Genuinely. question. That's, a that's, great what, question. That's, that's the situation you're in right now. Well, when you have three politicized branches of government simultaneously, one was supposed to be the check and balance on the other. We, we didn't foresee that all three would be politicized simultaneously and used uh, uh, for whatever ends the masters have in mind. I mean... Uh, the fact that judges will not have hearings about, uh, you know, COVID cases and they wouldn't touch the January 6 prisoners and they and the and the attorney general is going after Catholics and churches saying that they're 
uh, uh, you know, right wing crazy people. I mean, th I, I've never seen a politicized government like this. And I grew up in the 70s. I mean, this is crazy. I, even under Nixon, this didn't happen. You know what well, I mean? Someone, I mean yeah. Well, someone just said vote harder as a solution. So. <laughs> <laughs> vote, vote more often. You know, I mean, uh, no, well, go on, go on. No, finish no, no, I'm just saying, I mean, it, this. You know, when you break down the system of voting, when you break down the system of justice with the Department of Justice, when you break down, you know, situations with the courts, I mean, what have you have left? I mean, you have a Nuremberg style court system right now that's out of out of uh, early uh, uh, Nazi Germany. You've got a situation where the media is out of control. You've got a situation where the Chinese influence is is we don't even know what's going on with the Chinese influence, to be honest with you. It, it, you know, they may be passing money left and right to the Biden administration. I mean, I disagree. This, a, don't get me started on the China thing. I think people are very wrong on the China thing, you know. But right. anyway, 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 anyway. No, no, no. I, I'm just saying we don't know because w the bottom line is we don't have an accountable media, which is getting back to my idea yes. of having an oversight of the media is all. I'm, the only reason I'm pointing these things out is we need some sort of and I don't mean eliminating the First Amendment. I'm talking about having some sort of uh, situation where they're called to be accountable. And it could be like the old think about the old Columbia Learner, uh, 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 Journalism and Review. What did Columbia uh, Journalism Review do? It held media accountable, Jose. Yeah. Right. Yeah, That's gone, yeah. bro. That's gone. That's gone. That institution has been bought and sold. So what do we have now? Nothing. Nothing. There's an old FDR quote that says, better a government that errs in the spirit of hope and charity than a government that does wrong in, you know, uh, in its intention, in its, in, in its cold and evil intention, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer in that, you know, because nobody's perfect. Government isn't perfect, right? But mm -hmm. I think what you need is you need the citizenry right now to be that hand of justice, to be the accountability. I mean, do like what I did. I just went out there. Oh, no, no, I yelled at absolutely, them. Absolutely, absolutely the way to go. I it's, yelled it at them. It seems to be that everything in the United States, every institution has become a game show. They've all become the voice. In other words, if there's a case where somebody gets killed, if there's public outcry, a DA will vote the other way. Uh, if there's a situation where there's the bright light of the media shined, or the, not, not even the media, the public, all of a sudden becomes aware of a case, these uh, uh, politicized cases dissipate and disappear. But we can't run a country like that, having the media, uh, uh, having the people having to vote on every single political case, whether it's it's what's his name in Chicago and, and uh, the gun case that we were talking about earlier, in Kenosha, Rittenhouse. the Rittenhouse case. We can't run a country or a justice department like this where the, it's literally a vote, thumbs up or thumbs down of what the people believe should be righteous justice or not. No, that's true. That's, that's not true. justice. That's revenge, bro. That's yeah, a right. different that's a different thing. You know, the word justice has now been conflated with revenge. That is not you know, we can't have a, an outrage of the mass populace to decide whether somebody should be indicted. I mean, that's just an insane way to run a, a, a justice system. That's where we are right now. Until somebody pushes back against a particular indictment against somebody where the people go, whoa, 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 that's just crazy. Or the reverse. How come that guy's been indicted? That's just crazy. Well, we remember see that, that with Trump. We see that no, with but Trump we see right that, Remember the guy in the bodega who was attacked up? Oh, uh, yeah, think, yeah, right. Remember that? And he killed the guy who was attacking him, the, the Latino guy? Yeah, that was guy. fucked up. The Alvin okay, Bragg but really it, was the, it was the people voting voting that forced the hand of the DA in New York not to prosecute the guy. If that the people did not vote by YouTube indirectly, that guy would have been in Rikers Island today. And yeah, you know exactly. that, Jose. Oh, of course I do. I mean, look, <laughs> I'm with you with what no, you're no, saying. No, no, I'm, just, I'm right? just putting it out. I, I know. I'm I know. Not, I, I like, I, it's just like, I genuinely believe right now we just need to move away from mainstream media. I look, mm -hmm. Oh, we wait, 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 we're yeah, not yeah. disagreeing with you on that. We're just he's just talking about basic accountability. But yeah, I'm we, trying to hold agree. them accountable and hold their feet to the fire. And we need a new system. We need a, a media bill of rights. And I think there's something to that. I'm not sure of the exact bullet points. And that's why I need the essay from you on Monday, because if you can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So where do we go from here? What do you want to do next? You want to you're going to go out and you're going to protest. What? What's your next? What's on your agenda, Jose? 
whatever comes on my yeah, lap. Don't tell me. Don't tell me because I, and then they'll have, you know, guards there or something like no, that. No, genuinely, these things come to me last minute sometimes. Right. So, and which is the best so, way to I do think it. They should be, yeah, they should be last minute. They should be run and gun operations. Tell, so, me your, yeah. tell me your opinion on the RFK candidacy. Uh, ah. Uh, uh, not so cut uh, and dry, is it, brother? So here's the thing. All right, go ahead. I like him. I don't like the Democratic Party. Right. I want to trust him, but I think mm -hmm. his stance on environmental issues is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. At the same time, though, he refused to answer the question as to whether or not he would endorse Biden should he lose the primary. Mm -hmm. And he, the way he refused it was like, oh, we're not going to get to that. I'm going to win. It's like, eh, come uh, on. People do say that. That is a common answer, though. That is yeah, but common. come on. It's a simple you got to give Trump credit. He said no. <laughs> yeah. no, I mean, come on. no right. he was the only person honestly up there is saying i don't know i don't think so <laughs> i genuinely think if you had a debate between trump and rfk jr you might actually have an honest debate which is what the establishment does not want okay that's my opinion on the oh RFK. Yeah. The, yeah a lot but, of people agree with you on that but but here's my thing though like i don't look for saviors i don't look for for one guy to save the country and everything I don't vote anymore. I mean, I did vote for Trump twice. Now, you know, people are thrown off by that because they're like, I thought you were not on this, not on this channel. They're not. I, I may recommend the River Keepers by RFK Jr., a book he wrote about cleaning up the Hudson River in the in the 1970s uh, as one of his original environmental books, as a hands on uh, blue collar version of environmentalism. So you may really? want to take a look, may want to take a look at the River Keepers. If you if you like the Hudson River, uh, why it's clean today is because of RFK Jr. Really? Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know about the Bronx River? You know why that one's clean? I, I assume because some group of people got together and decided to get it cleaned. Hugo Chavez, man. Yeah. Okay. I'm serious. No, no. So the story goes that, and actually, I know some of the organizers who organized this. Mm -hmm. um, the Bronx was like a mess, right? And so the Bronx no, River was just no. like. <laughs> Dude, if you ever fell into the Bronx River when I was a kid, you could kiss your ass goodbye. No kid ever came out of there alive. <laughs> so I, I grew up in Coney Island. You know, at least we had Coney oh, Island. Oh, you're Coney Island? Yeah, I'm Coney Island, Warriors. bro. Warriors. <laughs> you know, that's funny. Now, that's funny, bro. <laughs> yeah. Wow, yeah, what yeah. a great reference. Nobody got that one, Jose. That's a, that's, <laughs> People that's should total, get that one. Yeah, watch the I Warriors. I love that this, movie. Watch the Warriors that's... this weekend if, if you want to see what Jose is talking about. But yeah, so anyway, anyway, like they, they were pleading with the politicians, like, we want to clean up the Bronx River. And nobody would say. And then they organized, I don't know if it was Hugo Chavez himself or somebody who represented Hugo Chavez came and was like, what the hell, man? This river's a mess. He gave the money and he worked with the local politicians to clean up the river. And like, that's why that one was cleaned up because of someone else, you know? <laughs> well, weren't they buying gas for Sitka? Wasn't he distributing home fuel at one point to impoverished citizens in New York? Uh, I don't know anything um, about Hugo Chavez's um, it was, it was Sitka political was a interference. Sitka was a Venezuelan uh, uh, oil company. And I think they that to stick it to the man, meaning the capitalist man, he was distributing in New in New England and Northeast uh, free home heating fuel one year, one uh, harsh winter. Oh, well, uh, that that sounds like something he would do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to look that up, but I think I vaguely remember actually. That. There were a lot of cases like that in the seventies, I believe. There was one town in maine i think where they wrote to a diplomat in russia mm -hmm. saying listen you know our politicians we want this bridge fixed that hasn't been fixed in 10 years and then they threatened to send some diplomats over to go look at it americans got wind of this and then they fixed the bridge up immediately that's interesting mm -hmm. that might be a new style of activism where we just go you know putin called today and he's willing to fix <laughs> this road and, and you go what yeah telephone from putin he says he, wanna, he was going to put asphalt down on uh, on the Third Street Bridge, <laughs> the Third Street Bridge. That's that's been a shithole bridge for years. The Third Avenue Bridge. Well, Putin said he's going to send some Russian engineers over tomorrow. <laughs> well, actually, you know, the Crimea Bridge was blown up, and then they right. fixed it back up in a few months. Right. Like, well, we got the fucking um, the Bronx Queen Expressway and Jackie Robinson Parkway. I don't know if you guys drive here. It's <laughs> right. horrible. You can't even drive in the Jackie Robinson. And, there are like, people who have gone into potholes in the BQE who never came out alive <laughs> when I was growing up. The B people, I lost relatives in the BQE potholes. It's worse than the Holocaust, bro. 
yeah, we got to call the guy who fixed that bridge to come here. You know, right, right. The guy who did the Crimea bridge. Yeah, exactly. That's, you know, I guarantee good... he wasn't union labor. He wasn't. Union labor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. You know, so that's my thoughts on RFK. Uh, what's your thoughts right, on well, Eric Adams as mayor of New York as the ex NYPD guy? Um, you know. <laughs> Dude, Look, I feel like I'm in the Bronx right now with you. This is great. We got to get Nate the cop. lawyer on with you. I was a transit cop for many I had, years. I had a feeling. For many years, I you had know. A feeling. And uh, <laughs> you know, I I just want to say, you know, Eric Adams. I didn't vote for him. I voted Sleewa, which again, it does not help. Boy, my that's image. funny. That's real. They don't. Even, they don't even know who Curtis Sleewa is. Anyway. Yeah, they do if they watch our show. If they watch our show, they know who Curtis Lee is. But yeah, which again does not help my case for being because I'm not a Republican. I swear to God. But no, like, no, I, that's cool. Either am I. You know, but I for you know for a long time before now, I had this thought of like I want to vote for the other guy or I yeah. want to vote for the anti-establishment guy. Now my philosophy is I vote for who I think should be in power, and if that means some nobody who's only going to get ten thousand votes, that's then that's what I'm going to vote for. Right. You know. So. Um, Anyway, my thoughts on Eric Adams. Ah, oh, man, I wish in the beginning, I was like, we're going to see where he goes. Right. Because he had actually talked to me, actually. And I wrote about this mm -hmm. uh, when the twin, uh, when there was a fire that happened up here in the Bronx that killed like 20 some people. It was in the beginning of his mayoral ship. Mm hmm. And then just down the street from me, a gas ex leak happened and it exploded a whole house. And um, what. Uh, what what happened was he came to do a press conference and I was going to go yell at him the way I did Kamala Harris. But he actually was like, whoa, whoa, whoa brother, hold on. I'll talk to you when I finish with the press. Mm. And he did. Now, mm. he was using me as a photo op because the press, he, we were walking through the rubble and he was taking, you know, people were taking photos of us. And I said to him, though, listen, you know, um, the fires in the Bronx are just going to keep happening right now. And you're going to have a resurgence of the Bronx is burning again. And then he said, well, what about Richie Torres's plan of putting, you know, smart thermometers in people's apartments? And I said, all that does is notify 311 when there's no heat in the house. The problem isn't that, you know, 311 isn't getting complaints. I would know because when I lived in a basement apartment in Morris Heights, mm -hmm. my ceiling had collapsed from sewage water because I lived in a basement apartment. My landlord or the super wouldn't do anything to fix it. I called 311. You know what they said? That's horrible. We'll be there in two weeks. Mm -hmm. We're on the way. Yeah. Like, yeah, sure. Okay. I was homeless by that point, right? So I told this to Eric Adams. He said, okay, we'll set up a task force of people to go and investigate why the fires are going to continue to happen. So I did. I recruited like these two CUNY professors who did a lot of work, who are epidemiologists, who did a lot of work on the science of fire, who know why this was going to happen. I recruited a bunch of college kids. Mm. I recruited some people in the media. And then this guy ghosts me. You oh, know why he ghosts oh, me? Oh, you know why he goes I, I genuinely believe he goes to me because I was actually about to like propose a real solution that was gonna oh, yeah. mess with whatever the hell kind of deal they had. Yeah, and yeah. The, you know, um yeah. I uh wow. Wow. yeah, it's it's a terrible history. You know, here in the city we had this guy, Roger Starr, planned shrinkage, right? Mm -hmm. The whole idea was there's too many people in the city. Let's yeah, what is that some... about? I saw that on your Twitter feed. What's that about? From what? the sixty from the sixties? Yeah, so Roger Starr was a city planner in 71, and he said, look, a lot of these poor communities, you know, we kind of don't need them here in the city. What we need is planned shrinkage. That was the name of his plan that that, that was called hmm. planned shrinkage, right? That was the official city policy in coordination yeah. with the Rand Corporation. And the idea was simple. Why spend all this money on these poor people if they're just going to burn themselves down? Here, you know what? Let's uh, Let's close down fire stations in East New York, in the Bronx, Queens, mm -hmm. and some parts of Manhattan. Let's close down some funding for hospitals here. Let's not build any more subway stations here. And hopefully they'll just die off. That was the official New York City policy in 71 to about to like 80 something. Hmm. And um, the Rand Corporation, who was working for Vietnam, like, like they were making all the statistics for Vietnam, right? Saying like, oh, we're winning, you know, we're winning the war. Well, we're that's what El that's what Ellsberg reveals in the Pentagon Papers. It's the Rand Corporation's plan for Vietnam and the fact that they were losing. 
those same guys are also working as city planners for New York City, saying it's okay, you can cut some costs here in the poor areas, you know, people will just leave, you know, and people did leave. And the only people who left were the people who left in all the rubble that was around. And so that, my point is that that policy never really left. Mm, you still have it. You know, why has it why is it the case that it takes 15 years for one subway line to be built and it only goes up from Wall Street to 96th Street? I mean, what what the hell is that? Right. You know, the Bronx is so over congested that they there there were schematics drawn to extend the queue line, which goes only up to 96th Street into the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And Hewlin Jack, who was the former uh, Manhattan Borough president, had this idea. He said, you know, we have a lot of traffic from cars that come in from Jersey. What if we extended the C train up underneath the George Washington Bridge? Right. Okay. So that people could park their cars in New Jersey and keep their dirty, smelly cars from Jersey in Jersey. Mm -hmm. Take, you know, pay how, the metro car. How much do you hate Jersey? I just want to get off the <laughs> So Look, well, go on, go on. I've had three exes from Jersey, okay? They no, no, I, I had a feeling. I know, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. <laughs> they came what? across the GW Bridge. Yeah, right. So, um, <laughs> you know, the idea was that in this way they can park in Jersey and then pay the Metro card fare and get on the train underneath the George Washington Bridge and also work with the PATH train so that people don't have to pay a transfer. Because you have to pay 275 if you're right. on the subway to the PATH, pay another 275 Make it one price. Mm -hmm. So that then you can have a flow of people coming in and out, you know, interstate travel, simple. And it would have alleviated 30 to 40 percent of car traffic during the work days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and that wasn't implemented because of Robert Moses and planned shrinking. Well, I was going to get to Moses because he's the previous guy, right? But I we're mean, not going to because I'm going to be the bad guy here. Wait a minute. What are you trying somebody to say, Hunley? To do, somebody has to do his last call. There's super oh, chats oh, that oh, are... Oh, oh, right. Okay. All right. So, hear. Jose, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, Hunley's got, I'm a, the uh, no. Hunley's got seven kids to feed, and we got to do, <laughs> right. do these super chats, bro. We got to yeah, do these super chats. So, should we say goodbye to Jose? Or what hey, It's up to you, Jose, if you want to hang out while we read super chats. Dude, I would just start cold, smoking weed and drinking at this point. I wouldn't even wait for Hunley. He, but, he's you just know what? I'll take you up on that. Right. <laughs> Wait a second. I didn't mean it that way, Jose. What the? Oh, my God. Where did he go, Hunley? He took it the I'm wrong way. Get my blood light. Oh, no. no, get, the, no. get the Smirnoff vodka. That's the new one. Ugh. Did you know that um, she actually, whatever, Dylan Mulvaney, from what I understand, also got hired by Tampax? And yes, nobody can see that. the irony. Okay. No, no, I saw the there. irony. I saw the irony too. Okay. She, she has been, or he has been struggling with well, Tampax. Well, for we a can't. While. We have we cannot miss Jenny. Well, there's a new one. There's whatever. a new one, as I said, called Queen out of Texas, who just got hired um, as the spokesperson for Smirnoff uh, Smirnoff uh, vodka. So there's a new Mulvaney. Happy Friday, bro. All right, the, uh, uh, Cinco de Mayo, man. <laughs> yes, the, uh, oh yeah. When your parents were in the Young Lords, Jose, how did you feel as a kid? <laughs> All right, so uh, first super chat here is from uh, Asherod. <laughs> Mark, please read yeah. from the most to the least lascivious. L, uh, JFK, LBJ, Elder Bush, Bill Clinton, Hillary, Obama, Trump, Biden. Lascivious meaning what? Sexual deviance? Or what is <laughs> well, lascivious? deviance would probably be most. Just Look, I don't care LBJ. who those other people are. LBJ trumps them all. That's all yeah. I can tell you right now. Uh, it's That's LBJ by, by a mile. That's the next there place. is no second place. No second place. Uh, Bart says he's volunteering for RFK Juniors in the. Primary. Hey, wait a second! That's what I said. All right. Well, if he gets a um, nomination, in I don't California, see in California, if RFK Junior gets a nomination, I don't see how Barnes could support Trump in the general. Well, as, I, not to misquote Barnes, but he said on, uh, on 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 Rich's show the other day that he said, "Wait till we get to the general." before we talk about it so just to yeah the primary is the primary it's two different yeah things. that's what Rich, that's what robert was saying so that i hope that serves as some sort of answer but you're asking us about what barnes said so I, he's not here right now uh super sticker from nicole underhill thank you very much um tank mosey or tank mosey i think this is for you jose yep thanks for putting yourself out there jose yeah look at that somebody just sent you 20 bucks bro uh, yeah um you don't hold your that. breath don't hold your breath <laughs> You could have Mark's half. Yeah, yeah, you could have Hunley's <laughs> half. <laughs> uh, we got two pounds from Craig. Good yeah. guest. Better than Meathead or MT Head last week. They yeah. did not like Michael Tracy. 
And, oh um, man. And I'm a fan of Tracy. I did it. I'm kind of like you. I mean, I felt the same way about Michael Tracy and I, and I said, even afterwards to him, you know, I, I he I'm, lost a couple points in your esteem. Let's be honest. Uh, when, when, yeah. I mean, he, he, yeah, he ducked, but, he ducked some stuff that was not. Yeah. Cool. yeah but it, it, he's still a guy from Jersey, so I don't care. <laughs> Uh, DH, I won't ask any more for Joey Heatherton. You guys rock. Well, thank what, you very much. I do a show on Joey Heatherton for this guy. What is he going to do? What is that? Oh, it's $50. We better do a show. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Yeah. Hunley, well, hold, let Hunley, let's get that Heatherton story up to up the hopper there. There's some DH really wants this thing. Uh, yeah. Whoever the hell that is, by the way. <laughs> no. Um, Sargon Sarkis is a new member. Thank you oh, very welcome much. Welcome aboard. And then Jay is talking about Trank, which I had. Um, looked at before. Um, it's a fentanyl heroin laced with xylit. I guess it's xylazine, which right, is which anesthetic, is, and that's horses. why Narcon. Yeah, it's, a, it's a it's an animal uh, anesthetic, to be frank. That's, and nothing uh, can stop its withdrawals either. It's a problem mainly in PA. So it's good. Right, good I've heard about it in in Pennsylvania. I heard Fetterman snorts it every morning for some reason. <laughs> that's it. It's no, a no, zombie that's, drug. And it, dude, I, I don't know old. why Fetterman believes so much in this uh, uh, product. I mean, it's really weird. I mean, he's doing commercials for it now. Odd. All right. Um, I think you're going to disagree with this. Uh, fentanyl overdose or fentanyl overdose from contact is a myth. It can't happen unless you're handling a bunch of patches. Sorry. I was going to say, yeah, then how is it applied in a freaking patch? Obviously, surface. <laughs> it, it, never mind. Sorry. Too many EMS guys uh, knocked out by it. Sorry. Uh, push cart Jimmy with $50 and no Whoa, question. Whoa, push cart Jimmy on a roll down there yeah. on, on, on Orchard Street. I'm telling you. Wow. Thank you so much, dude. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Gino says that you were a great guest. Bravo. Jose. Let's give it up. Let's give it up for Jose. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great. Guest. And we have some tips in here from locals. Uh, Pasha Moyer sent $2 saying he was going to miss today's stream. Well, we missed you too, Pasha. Um, he's doing support for his wife's piano recitals in um, Central Time. And most of the kids will not be doing this. Interested Party sent a $10 tip. And you'll appreciate this. I'm using Ziggy's stemless AUS glass to toast the M of, end of Kim Gardner's tenure as St. Louis District Attorney. Wow. Attorney. wow. Shout out to Missouri's AG, Andrew Bailey, for keeping the pressure on. Wow. Kay Blackston, uh, great <coughs> show as always. Hold on. We have to interrupt the show for the uh, daily Heroes of the Blues. Today's Heroes of the Blues is Blind Blake. Repeat, Blind Blake, Hero of the Blues, one of our sponsors of the show. Um, Jacksonville's Arthur Blake ranks among the most distinguished rag and blues guitarists of all time. In the 1920s, he based his career in Chicago. Between 1926 and 1932, he recorded over 80 albums for Paramount. Afterwards, uh, to fade into obscurity. Unlike most blind performers, he played dance-oriented music. His polished technique and effortless sounding improvisations attracted many imitators, but admitted no equal. Blind Blake, today's Heroes of the Blues. All right, Blind Blake. All right. Um, Serena, um, Sarah Noah, I never can say the name right. Um, Reapens said Jose is super. Super. Yep. Huron Trader said Jose was excellent. And... Um, Rogue Thunder on local said, "Bravo, Mr. Vega. We are all yeah. warmed by the fire of your conviction. Wow, great show, gentlemen, and some good praise there for you, Jose. Yeah, Jose, that can go on your resume. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, actually, I lost my job doing this stuff. Uh, oh, is that wow. true? I believe it. Yeah, yeah, and I got a call from DC police too. It's like, uh, what do they yeah. want? Well, because I had confronted Hakeem Jeffries back in. No, February. you went after him too." Yeah, I said to him, like, hey, like, are you going to investigate the Nord Stream? I'm, I'm obviously making this brief. And then he said, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I've had no information that we blew up the Nord Stream. And then uh, I said, okay, yeah, well, because Seymour Hersh says you weren't briefed on it. It was just Biden and Blinken. Mm -hmm. And then he says, I'm going to speak more generally about our relationship with Ukraine and Biden's great leadership in Ukraine. And then I cut him off and I said, we committed an act of war. OK, mm -hmm. uh, how are we going to hold them accountable? And then I didn't stop. And I said, you know, listen, you're from Brooklyn, right? You right. know when to call BS when you see it. Well, so That's do right. I. That's and right. this is bullshit right now. And I want mm -hmm. you to say something. And then they took my mic 
So I said, that doesn't stop me. And then I started walking towards him, which maybe in hindsight wasn't the best idea. Mm -hmm. But I just said, I want you to say something about the bombing. Right. You can see this on my Twitter feed, too. Um, wow. We're going to be busy. Yeah. We have homework, too, Mark. I know. I can't wait to get into that Twitter feed. Let me ask something. What about the Karen who was mirroring you in front of your face, like that style where they try to physically block people by walking back and forth? Yeah, what is that? Who invented that? Was that I, something I, that was that something that Joe Frazier did with Ali or something? I mean, where did that come from? I locked eyes with her for one second and I felt her as if she like read my past and future or something. <laughs> Look deep into me. <laughs> Dude, all I heard was the audio get out of my face, Karen, or something yeah. to that effect. That was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, right. I don't know what that was about. Okay. Kiki Ray wants her bell rung. She does. I'll be right over. There it is. <laughs> and uh, back to locals. Otto, 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 Otto. Anyway, Otto is saying, Jose, can you give us some good heckling tips for beginners? I think oh, we can figure beginners. it out. Well, talk <laughs> loud. I mean, raise your voice. That's no, a good no. One. Well, well, yes, also. but Enunciate uh, I mean, is a good one, right? The AOC intervention was number six for me before mm -hmm. it went big and before – I was able to actually be as eloquent as I was then. So to you, to beginners, I would just say the scariest part, and this is true for me still, even to this day, the scariest part is standing up and breaking the social contract. Right. Okay. Right. You know, because there's like, Absolutely. you're not supposed to stand up and interrupt a speaker, right? That's not supposed to happen, but sometimes extraordinary circumstances call for extraordinary measures, you know, and you have to stand up and be a defender of the truth. So to you, I say, don't worry too much about what you say. Yes, research the topic. Yes, know what you're going to talk about, but practice standing up and breaking that social contract because the moment you stand up and you say that first word, hey, congressman, it's like you command all the authority in that room, even gotcha. for that split second. That's all you. Well, how about when they tell you to sit down or we'll get to that or you're talking over us or you're being impolite or we could talk to you afterwards? What do you say to that, Jose? It's like LeBron. You got his game time. <laughs> you got to tune it out. <laughs> right, no, right. Oh, no, you, no. You, that's a good answer. That, yeah, tune it out. You, you have to tune it out. You have to lock eyes with the person you're going after. Right on, and bro. And just remember what you're there to do, you know? Is it okay to sit down maybe a couple minutes, you know, of getting whatever you have to say? Sometimes you don't always need to be dragged out. Sometimes you can just take another seat take a seat and you know and then it makes it awkward for the speaker because now they like they know you're there and, yeah you know yeah. maybe and and um but what, what just, about when the audience turns on you what do you do then jose again oh well at that point like if the audience is like trying to shout me out boo me down yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. then at that point i kind of switch to a mode of like okay well at least the internet's gonna hear what i have to say ah. so i bring the microphone closer to me and and then the internet is going to think and it's like kind of you're still delivering the message yeah you're still sticking yeah, yeah. to script but this time speak closer into your phone and just keep going because the right. world will see what you're doing right and when they're grabbing you and dragging you out do you just keep yelling or what's your policy my policy is i i'm i have a flair for the dramatics but <laughs> but the, although jelani cobb did throw me down so like or oh. i was pushed down okay, oh, okay. so like when All you right. see when you hear me say god damn it yeah, that's because like I did take a tumble there. Okay. Um, but if a cop comes up to you or even security, they say you have to go. Okay, you really have to go, and then they start dragging you. Go with them. Give them yeah, a little. Yeah. yeah. You know, give yeah. them a little. Give them a little. Don't make but it not, hard. But not not a civilian like this guy from uh, Colombia, right? I mean, what authority? No, does that's he have? illegal. That was right. Illegal right. That was crazy. I mean, this is my party, and you'll cry when I want to. I mean, what's the deal here? I mean. <laughs> And and I could have pressed assault charges. Yes, but like, that's what yeah. I was getting at. Yeah. You All know. right. Um, let me get back to real Hold quickly. On. Hun on a mission here. <laughs> well, I, you know, it, <laughs> we do have a thing. Uh, Jay Kurt said, uh, "Miss my um, or Miss New York uh, two dollars I I may have guys. I, I do my best to capture them all, and I star them, and I put them on the side." We have a lot of people who are talking, so I don't know if I'm going to have to do a disclaimer like uh, our friend Viva Fry does, but I, I don't 
intentionally miss any super chats. I'm pretty diligent, as Mark can tell you, as I'm interrupting the flow and everything else, saying, "Hey, um, let, let's get to these super chats, etc." Mm -hmm. But um, if, if you feel like if I slip, you're going to be upset. What is he? You know, he says rook, chip, uh, or he says different terms. You know, don't. I I, I can't I can't right. help it if I you know if I miss some. Uh, Ziggy, you can still subscribe to the bell, though. That would be helpful. Hey, Ziggy. Yeah, Ziggy is not Super Chat, but she does create a lot of merch that Mark was just showing off. Like, you can't make this up with a stem. Um, by popular demand, uh, the new glass is going to say, come on, Bobby. Oh, really? Yeah, wow, yeah. that in tribute to RFK Jr.? Or Well, in tribute to your impersonation of LBJ that everybody... Oh, uh, come on, Bobby. Loves, loves, loves. And let me see. We have a $50 rumble rant. That's nah, half a gram, Jose. Let's party like it's 1999, <laughs> bro. <laughs> this is from A. Wolfer, and it's great job, Jose. So thank yeah, you, Jose, bravo, for getting bravo. us $50. Yeah. Bravo. Um, but on that note, what? I always have to pull out because Oswald... Look what we're selling here. Look what we're reduced to, Jose. <laughs> I mean, we're grown men. We're selling like yeah. stuffed animals, bro. That's right. I, I didn't know it was going to come to this later in life. But damn, Hunley. Damn. You can find Oswald and other great merch in a link below. Mark will never I'm wearing turn one away. of the hats. I just ordered that pullover sweatshirt again because uh, oh, my girlfriend stole the other one. So and then we have a, a bucket one. hat if you like the bucket hat. Good undercover uh, hat, Hunley. Good undercover hat. Yeah. Jose, I just wanted to thank you for coming on today. Absolutely elucidating uh, to the audience, to myself. At some point, you should think about running YouTube guerrilla theater training Definitely. videos. You know we what I'm do. saying? Oh, we okay. Do. Uh, of course. Uh, of we course already do. do uh, of course you do. Thank and listen, you. Oh. you know, I'd love to be a brand ambassador. With everything yeah. that entails, I'd be a lot better than Dylan Mulvaney. So, all right. So, we got to yeah. send him some merch now. I'll, I'll <laughs> we'll get go. you some of our merch, bro. You can I'll wear, it. I'll little wear, it, wear it proudly. <laughs> wear it proudly up on Jerome Avenue. Wear sure. It proudly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, I used to live on Jerome, too. I yeah. know. I had a feeling. That's why I mentioned Jerome. That's why I mentioned. All right. I took, yeah. I took, a, I took a shot. Jay Kurtz, if LBJ was all powerful, why didn't he run and not automatically win? Well, he <laughs> well he there was a war, there was a war going on that wasn't going very very well. So, <laughs> yeah, RFK's dad uh, had to do something about it. All right. Well, on that note, folks, um, please consider subscribing. Follow us on locals. Yeah, Jose, I'm on PayPal with the JFK Book Fund. If you want to donate to that book fund, that would be Venmo and PayPal. Thanks. And I'm on PayPal just to. Um, collect any money that you wish to donate to me for that's the bell for subscriptions don't forget to subscribe and we will see you we're not going to tease next tuesday but they'll want to see it right oh yeah you're going to want to see tuesday that's going to be crazy okay. is a big one. Not, i'm not going to tell you who it is though all right uh, folks it's been wonderful and see you tuesday thank you mm -hmm.